Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Select Board meeting. Today is February 4th, 2020. Uh, we are airing on Verizon Channel 33 and Comcast Channel 22. Uh, tonight's agenda will have liaison reports, the town manager report, and public comment. We'll then have a um, brief presentation on the upcoming census. We'll be voting to close the warrant for the local election and state primary as well as annual town meeting. We'll be voting to appoint someone to the Board of Registrars. There'll be a discussion on the fiscal year 21 budget. Then we're going to have a hearing for uh, downtown parking changes and other safety changes. We'll then go to a future agenda discussion and we will go adjourn to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. All right, uh, we'll start with liaison reports. John? I have nothing tonight. Okay, Mark? Thank you. Um, so I prepared a little little statement. So this is uh, in regards to the RMLD. Um, so Vanessa and I attended the last RMLD Board of Commissioners meeting on January 23rd. The commissioners have been discussing a few things that I think are, are pertinent to the discussion about um, the payment that will be going forward. So their discussions have focused on additional capital improvements, concerns that they're total demand has been declining and concerns about the size of the annual payment to Reading. Um, Vanessa and I, after our last board meeting here, uh, went in and talked to them about suggesting a sit down, a meeting between either the full boards, uh, RMLD board and the select board, uh, or some representatives to talk about the needs of each side. Um, and there is some activity to, to set up that meeting. The commissioners asked that the select board come to them with a proposal if we'd like it to be considered. Currently on the table, uh, they have three proposals that they're discussing. And what we're talking about is what they call the below the line payment. This is the um, not related to sales right now, but a, a payment that's coming to the town of Reading. So they have three proposals that are on the table and they've asked us if we would uh, bring forward our own thoughts. The three proposals right now um, one of them is, uh, uses a, a five-year formula that looks at usage. Uh, the impact on us would be in calendar 22, a $200,000 decrease in the payment, and that increases to about 500000 by the year calendar 27. These are annual decreases. So that's kind of proposal one. Proposal two um, is a, uh, a higher payment based on usage um, the payment would continue through the end of 21, and effective July of 22, it uh, would move to a new formula. Um, the net of this is it would be a, a, a fairly small decrease, $20,000 roughly, um, starting in, in calendar 22, um, and then that would continue, and it floats with their their demand, their usage. That's the option B. That's B. That's B exactly. Option C is that essentially they would pay out for 10 years the current payment and then uh, it appears to stop at that point uh, as they proposed it. So those are the three proposals that they have on the table. Um, we had a, you know, some discussion about it and, and I think the net from the commissioners was they'd like the select board to come back to them um, fairly in fairly short order with a, with a, uh, a proposal. So I, I'd like to suggest a couple things. One is that um, the board direct uh, the town accountant to collect and analyze some information related to reserves and capital accounts on a tight timeline. So we talked to Sharon about that. That's item one, I would suggest. Item two is to see if the board would um, allow one of us to speak um, with town staff and then propose uh, at our February 11th meeting an alternative to share with the commissioners uh, in time for their next meeting, which is February 20th. The reason for that timing is that they may make a decision um, at that date. So that's that's kind of my, my update with, with suggestions. Um, Thanks. Um, so is the board comfortable with having you to mark myself coordinate with staff and with RMLD? To come up with a proposal at our next meeting. Right, so for the Feb 11th meeting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. You're the liaisons, so. Okay. John, are you okay with that? It makes sense that the liaisons would act within the framework of where they're assigned. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Good. Um, it would be valuable, I think, to 
do the analysis of those three in a net present value and then stream it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we should have that ready before the 11th to understand what those are. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and I'm also would suggest that um, the liaisons come back with more than one suggestion for presentation purposes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, and I guess one of the things to consider is, you know, they've got the same borrowing power because they can borrow through um, through the town um, because of the relationship that we have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I've heard a number of times that there's a capital needs that are driving this. Okay. Um, capital needs could easily be, you know, you could solve that problem with some, what was our last 1.8%? 1.06%. 1.06%. Um, borrowing power. I mean, honestly speaking, to me, <clears throat> I mean, something to consider yeah. Yeah. is <clears throat> to identify their capital needs, A. I mean, is it in the scope of 1 million, 5 million, 20 million? I, I don't know. We've heard capital needs, but not heard them identified. If then we turn around and say that that borrowing power is available to them, hmm. and then think about a you know, an adjustment, if an adjustment truly has to be made, you'd look at the actual cost of the adjustment and not some nebulous figure mm. that, it, you know, is out there. I, I think you, I think this thing has got to get pulled into the reality um, <clears throat> because the impact, listening to A and B, effectively, uh, by 27, they've eradicated I'm doing quick math because that's I can only do it that try to keep up with you. Um, but that's why I'm saying this needs to be calculated and streamed. <clears throat> Effectively, that removes A and B removes the override that just passed two he, years ago. He definitely it, does. It, it effectively X's it off, um, and it's already running near the end. Um, and if what you're doing effectively is doubling the actual need because you've eliminated a revenue source uh, this is big and I'll, I'll let me add to that which is that they have been seeing usage decline at about one at a rate of 1.5 percent per year and so the two proposals proposal one and proposal two um, are tied to usage so as usage decreases then presumably so would the payment to the tenant right um, so it's a it's a bit of a double win. I mean, so there's two hits inside of A and B. Yeah. And you know. And in one, and in three, there's a cliff. Yeah. So yeah. you know, let's it's just. Uh, what are we hoping for? Climate change ends ends the planet on the in the tenth year. <laughs> well, um, let's not hope for that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but your point is that will impact the end. I think that I think what this <laughs> gets down to is we cannot <laughs> allow. Um, unclear arithmetic um, to drive a decision by them, in my opinion. I think they really have to look at hard, hard numbers and understand the impact of the town and the impact to their, to, to who they serve and what the real cost is. And that's the idea behind exactly, yeah. John, bringing in uh, the town accountant to weigh in. Yeah, he has more information. Uh, so great, thank you. Good. Good. Just one point on that. I, you definitely need Sharon and Andre for most of that discussion, but um, our multi has a good understanding of what it would take to borrow because we've discussed it maybe starting three years ago. Oh, so they understand the time frame, they understand the terms, the details. They would need we would need about six months lead time um, just to plan a, an issuance and to go through a town meeting and, and get uh, permission. Um, and I don't, I can't speak as to why they do or don't choose to finance the way they, they have, but uh, they, they are aware. It's not that they don't know. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Yeah. I'm up to them at the meeting as well. Save it for later. <laughs> uh, Mark, is that all for you or do you have something else? Uh, the only other thing was that Vanessa and I also were at the uh, MMA meeting last week. I think it was like last week. I think it was only it was last week. Yeah. Um, 25th. Which was great. <laughs> It was really interesting. Um, I think we each took a lot of notes and want to uh, share back with staff some of the things. And Aaron, I have some great stuff for you, in fact, that came back. Um, 
Okay. It was it was really a worthwhile activity. Great. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks for setting up a potential meeting uh, with our MLD that will get us, you know, uh, some face-to-face, -face, uh, hopefully, resolution. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was to make it, uh, we received a lot of emails, the board members received a number of emails to attend last Tuesday's um, meeting at the library regarding the use of Daniel's house. And I, I wanted to make sure everyone knew that uh, Anne and I could, could not be there because we had, um, we're co-chairs of an ad hoc committee that um, includes members of the school committee, a board of library trustee, and some administration. So it's hard to get those meetings together and we, could, we just couldn't cancel that. So um, I'm sorry we, we missed that meeting. Um, quick update about the town forest. Uh, the planned removal of the unhealthy red pines has been completed in the forest and my understanding is that the next phase will include planting of white pine saplings that are native to, to this area um, and as well as clearing away some invasive plant species. So I think that'll be a great opportunity for, for us to get out and volunteer and, and be outside for a while. Um, when can we expect more information on that from a volunteer opportunity perspective? Um, I will make sure that that is, I'll bring that to your attention. They, they haven't decided yet, as far as I know. So, um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just some quick good news. I won't go in, in, into it in detail because we're going to be talking about it, I think, in our next agenda, perhaps. Um, the ad hoc committee that was uh, designed to set up a human rights um, 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 either committee or board uh, has has finished its work. We can, we had a vote um, last Thursday night. I can't tell you how relieved I am. Uh, we we got everybody on the same page. Everyone is enthusiastic about it. Uh, and the board will be getting an update next week. So, and I'm very grateful to all the people who participated and stuck with the process. It was a long process. Um, and then uh, two, two other quick things. Um, last meeting, we discussed the installation of five 5G microcell poles in town. And um, I was wondering if the board, if the board would like, uh, as liaisons, Ann and I could reach out and ask the Board of Health if they would look into the scientific literature on the possible effects of uh, these microcell uh, poles. I, I know they, they're stretched thin, they might, might not have the time, but that might be a resource that we could tap. I think that'd be fine. Where are we on the um, sub regulations? Oh, um, I guess I don't need an answer, but something we should think about for yeah, for yeah. I, I, th um, I think they voted on it, and now it's with us. Does that sound right, Bob? On the, on pesticide what's going regulations. On? on the pesticide regulations. Yes. Right. Yes, you have all of you have the most recent version that they voted on. That they, I don't know if they voted, but they passed it along to you for comments. Okay. okay. So okay. we have one well, need to and, add to and Town Council did. It's it's a town council approved version. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, and then that's it. I mean, there was an email today that Vanessa and I got yesterday. Sorry, an email yesterday from the chair of the recreation committee about pickleball um, and use of uh, getting some pickleball courts um, set up in town. And um, as as uh, the liaisons to the recreation committee, Vanessa and I will look into that for further and give you an update at at, um, at the next meeting. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, so Mark and I attended. There was a community meeting last week at the library regarding the former Daniel's house. There is a new property owner, and they have um, requested certain permits. Um, for to install either 
um, a facility, either a sober house or a recovery center. Um, and so there was a large population um, present last week. It cleared up a few issues as far as the potential use, um, the regulatory aspect of it. If you haven't had a chance to take a look and you're interested, um, please do. You can find it on YouTube on RCTV. It was January 30th. Um, Bob, I don't know if you want to add anything there. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I learned a lot and, and I had a fair, fairly good working knowledge of up to date what had happened. Um, they said a lot, a lot of, there was five people presenting, three that represented a treatment facility, one that was the property owner, one that was an attorney for the treatment center. A lot of things were said, um, and I thought a lot of good things were said, but the fact remains what they've put in front of the town does not match what they've said. So we can only operate on what we have. Um, we have a staff meeting with town council tomorrow morning to discuss it further. I haven't had a chance to talk to Chris since the Thursday night meeting, so I just don't know. But we can't, we have to operate on facts. We have to operate on what has been requested of us. Uh, we can have discussions about the things they talked about, but we, we must by law act on what they've put in front of us in some time frame. But I, I thought it was helpful in terms of, I, again, I heard a lot, staff heard a lot that we hadn't heard previously. Okay. Um, thanks, Bob. So uh, our next meeting is on February 11th. Uh, so if we can have an update, even just okay. part of the town manager report, that would be helpful. Uh, sure. E even if it's to say there's been no change. Right. Great. All right. Um, so now we will hand it over to Bob for the town manager report. Oh, thanks. I have two short things and a bit of a longer one. Um, your next meeting on the 8th, which is a Saturday, is 9 o'clock uh, in the morning at the Masonic Hall at 110 Haven Street. I sent you an email from Jane today. I hope you all saw it. Mm -hmm. um, we're all looking forward to that, and thanks, John. Mm -hmm. um, second one is on Leap Day, February 29th. Uh, Congressman Moulton is going to do a town hall in Reading at the library from 1 to 2 o'clock, and that's on a Saturday. Sorry, Bob, can you say that date again? Certainly. It's Leap Day, February 29th, which is a Saturday. He will be at... Uh, having a town hall meeting at the library uh, from 1 to 2 o'clock. Um, he has offered to meet with um, any and all community leaders at 1230 in, in advance, so if you want to let me know, um, we'll work that out. Um, his staff has indicated that they are exempt from opening meeting law, but I want to check that in case you have a quorum. You know, probably just post you anyways, but we'll, we'll work on that complication. But I just wanted to make sure the board knew. Um, and then the third thing's a little longer, but it's it's a happy story. Um, on Monday, February 3rd this week, I visited the State House to discuss Camp Curtis. Special thanks to Governor Baker for taking an hour of his busy schedule to meet with us. <clears throat> Governor Baker and one of his staff members, Mass Massachusetts National Guard Adjutant General Major General Gary Major General Gary Keefe, and two of his staff members. A representative from DCAM, which is the State Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance, Senator Lewis, Representative Jones, uh, Wakefield Town Administrator Steve Mayo, and I were in attendance. Uh, Major General Keefe began a presentation by profusely thanking the Town of Reading for being such a good community partner, and my thanks go out to DPW, Police, Fire, and Facilities for their assistance they've given Camp Curtis on a wide variety of issues over many years. It's really nice to be acknowledged that they appreciate that. Uh, he continued by acknowledging that they never forgot about our request to share space, but instead embarked on a very detailed master plan for the site during the past couple of years. Those plans look ahead through the year 2050. Um, he closed by showing a section of land that was not only available for a shared DPW facility, but he said if we could locate there, it would greatly improve their visibility and the security of the guard's overall operation at the site, and as such, we would be very, very welcome neighbors. Uh, Governor Baker spoke very favorably about putting vacant state land to better use and discussed various legislative and procurement aspects. He was interested and supportive that both communities could pursue more transit-oriented development along our current DPW parcels, if should they become available. Uh, we now have a much clearer path forward, although to be sure, there are many other hurdles surrounding the viability of the parcel they indicated for us to use. Uh, and the overall finances involved. Uh, again, I thank Representative Jones, Senator Lewis, Major General Keefe, and Governor Baker for their time and support on Monday. Uh, that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Bob. Awesome. All right. We'll open it up to public comment. Um, 
if you're here to speak on the downtown parking hearing, you're welcome to speak now, or you can hold your comments until uh, that agenda item comes up. It's up to you. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to speak for public comment? Yes? No way. Okay, great. So, Amy, I think it's over to you for the census. <coughs> Yeah. Come up, Laura. Come up, Laura. So, Bob, is that a tie in the morning? Is <laughs> 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 that a black thing going on? Yes, very, very It's memorial tie. I waited a sufficient amount of time. All right, so for 12. Uh, <laughs> I do want to thank the board for giving us a few minutes. Um, I am speaking on the representation of something called our Complete Count Committee. It's a real thing that um, we're working with the Census Bureau on. Um, I know all of you, and I hear your liaison reports, and you're asked every day, every night of the week to help out, participate, lend your voice to. Um, this is a, a really big deal. It's something that um, the federal census only happens, as you know, every 10 years. Um, everybody counts. Everyone counts. Um, but it, it's... It's also, there's a, there's a lot more. It's not just about the numbers and the data. It's, it's really about representation. It's about funding. Um, there's $675 billion in federal funding. So if you want a piece of that, or if you want to have representation for that, um, there will be redistricting going on throughout the country based on these numbers. Um, there are several uh, communities that are chronically <coughs> underreported and those include people experiencing homelessness, obviously, um, but also, believe it or not, um, human beings under the age of five. People don't count their babies, so count your babies, everybody counts. <laughs> um, and also, uh, there, there's a lot of, um, and, and here in, in Reading, obviously, we have to deal with people who might not physically be living here. Um, perhaps they've taken off for a little while and gone south. Um, so a lot of what we're doing, this Complete Count um, Committee, is has to do with education. Um, you've probably heard a lot about the census. Actually, social media groups are cracking down on this one area. They've all agreed that fake census information is something they're very concerned about. It is safe. It is private. It's never published. It's never personal. They'll never ask you for a social security number or bank account. Um, it cannot be used against you by any court or, or agency. This is all highly confidential Census Bureau employees, including those that come knocking at the door later on in the year, are sworn to protect confidentiality for life. So that's one of the big education points that we really want to make sure that we get through. It's a little different in 2020. Believe it or not, things have changed in the last 10 years. I don't know if you remember what you were doing 10 years ago, what you had in your pocket or how you communicated with your family. Things have changed quite a bit. Um, there are four ways to respond now. One is online. That is the primary way that people are being asked to respond. You will get something in the mail asking you to go online and answer the same, I think it's like seven questions or so, about each person that's residing in your residence. You can do it by phone as well, which is obviously an assistive technology for people who have vision problems or if you have TTY and you have um, audio um, hearing problems. There is a good old paper version, very limited, but obviously in this day and age we're trying to steer away from that. And there um, will be visits from census workers later on in the year. So this multi-department team, we have three goals. One is to raise the awareness about everything I just talked to you about. The second is to offer more education and information to everybody throughout town, and that's all ages, um, and understanding how important that this is. Um, and also to provide access, whether it's through computers, through telephone, um, just providing access for people to physically take it. Libraries are gonna play a huge part in the census this year. It's a little less obvious in a community like ours, but the little fun fact that's listed is that the census kicked off um, two weeks ago. Um, in Tuxuk Bay, Alaska. They physically have to get started out there in these very rural communities. Some of these communities have no way, no Wi-Fi, they have no computer, they're very limited um, data and access. So um, they have to, then they have to arrange how people are gonna get out there and do the count. So um, I'm just gonna turn it over to Laura a little bit and she's gonna kind of fill you in. About how more complex it is. So, um, about how more complex? Yes. So, th just to kind of go into a little bit about the difference. So, in Massachusetts, we also deal with the local census that's done every year. And I just want to talk a little bit about the differences and kind of go into some of the dates of it. But 
Um, the local census is used to create the street list, to create a voting list, to um, provide all the information as far as the residents within the town itself, but and also give information to the schools. So in order to be uh, registered in the schools, you have to be on the census. So um, the federal census, as Amy talked about, gets into you know setting the districts, uh, providing the money in the, to the to the um, local area, to the state, and to the districts, and within the town. But um, the local census has gone out. Uh, it should be hitting, should have hit your mailboxes today, if not tomorrow. Um, then the federal census, as, as Amy mentioned, the census day is April 1st. It, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's extremely important to reply to both. Um, in Massachusetts, if you don't reply to your census after in, after four years, you're deleted from the voter rolls. So it's extremely important to apply for both. Um, also, when we talk a little bit about the redistricting, it gets into uh, setting the precincts for for voting for uh, where you vote. Um, also, wanted to talk a little bit about the dates. That's important. Again, we talked about the local census; they just went out. Um, the mid-March is when the you'll be getting an information on how to respond to your census online. Around March 15th, you'll get a, like a postcard in the mail. April 1st, as I mentioned, is Census Day. Mid-May through July, census takers, that's when you'll start saying I'm going door to door. If you haven't replied to the census, either online or um, by phone then the, you, or by paper, that's when they're going to start knocking on the doors. Um, and all the data will be released in December around that area. Um, one thing I can test, I can personally testify to as far as the data being secure and everything that is, is collected by the Census Bureau remains with the Census Bureau and anybody that has any access to that data signs off on that that data does not go any further. And I can testify to that because I'm one of the ones that have to sign off on that, that we destroy any data that is not part of local census. So um, I believe that was, that was it. Um, just an interesting, another factoid is that um, the US Census is the um, largest peacetime undertaking that the U.S. government government undertakes. It's huge. They have, I can't remember how many temporary workers that they just, they have offices. Thousands. Thousands and thousands of people that come on board that are not even people knocking at the doors. If you know people looking for jobs, it's twenty-seven fifty an hour to go knock on doors and get census information. You have to be trained. There will be census training um, and they will be looking for that. Um, all right. I don't know why Census Day is April 1st, but it is April 1st. It's not an April Fool's joke. Um, this is really important. Actually, that's the day. That's the day when you fill it, whether you fill it out on July 1st or whatever, that you're supposed to fill out the information of who's living in your house on April 1st. It's a big day. It's a huge day. So, Reading, it's time to complete your U.S. 2020 Census. Who is living in your house on April 1st? Um, all day long on April 1st throughout the town, um, and we're working with, I didn't mention actually the whole team is um, with Laura from the town clerk's office, as well as Jane Wellman, who's the business administrator from also from um, admin services, from the public services side, we have Maria Prielli, as well as her whole team working at the Elder and Human Services uh, Department. So they're all on board. We have all received training and have, have um, met pe with people from the Census Bureau. All of our staffs are receiving training periodically. Um, and you're probably like, why do you need training? Just, just tell people. So it, it's actually a little more complicated than you'd think. But uh, from the Pleasant Street Center from 9 to 1, Town Hall here 1 to 5, and at the Reading from 5 to 9, the whole day, there will be uh, kiosks, computers available. There will be people available just simply to answer questions. If you really get into it, you can come and bring your teddy bears or answer questions about your teddy bear census at the library because, like we said, everybody counts. Um, there will be light refreshments at all at all um, events. So it's going to be, we want to make it into a really fun community event. We have not gone, gone so far as to make any PSAs or drag small children and puppy dogs into ads, but um, we do ask your help in trying to spread the word to make sure people do do this. It is actually quite important, particularly for the funding. So.
Any any questions? Yes. Uh, just a quick one, Amy. Um, you said April 1st is the day. Yeah. Let's say, for example, I was planning to climb Mount Everest, Everest yeah. on April 1st. See, those are uh, those tough questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, no, where, what your residence is, what your what is your residence? So, and, and there are no, very no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, my question is, uh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, like if you're on vacation that week? Yeah, if I'm out of town or, or don't have access or I can't do it yeah. for some reason on that day, can you do it on April 2nd? Yes, you can absolutely do it any time. But okay. the question is centered primarily around who's so the census is not perfect. Yes. Right. So it will never be a, as anyone who collects data knows. There's never perfect data. True. <laughs> so it, it, you know, it's a snapshot. The snapshot is supposed to be of April first, and there are we get a lot of questions about. Well, what am I? My son is at college. Does that count? Well, there are actually group quarters, people who count group quarters, like prison or college or nursing homes and you can decide how what those three things have in common mm -hmm. um, so there are people who count those things so my son is not is not living and residing in my house he is a he is a college student who lives away um, and so he he will be counted in that in that count he is not counted as someone who is residing in my house at that time on April 1st so that's why the April 1st date is important you're trying to emphasize that's what it is However, having said that, it's imperfect. You know, yeah. I, some people don't have a home on April 1st. Right. Or in between homes, or they've moved, they've just moved. Um, so it is never perfect. It is trying to get the best snapshot possible. Um, and then uh, who's physically there. And then there are a series of other questions regarding each person. Um, and, you know, you can just imagine what it would be like to have six... 19, 20, and 20 year olds who are renting an apartment in Lowell as they go to college answering that question because they rent that apartment. So you can imagine it, it's a little bit chaotic and um, lots of guidance. I'm sure they would be on it. They're going to be fantastic. Yeah. So, but it is important. So I guess we appreciate your time and um, as much as I make light of it, I think it is a very serious issue. So anything you can do to make sure, maybe swing by one of these places, get a sticker, have a piece of cake. So real quick, one thing that we didn't mention is that the link that is going to be provided to be able to um, go online is going to be good until the end of July. So you can answer at any time. It's just the information that you're providing is what was accurate on April 1st. On April 1st. To the okay. best of your yeah. knowledge. To the best yeah. of your knowledge, yeah. So. so is it true that the link won't be activated until April 1st? Mid no, uh, uh, mid-March. Yeah. So you can do it early. They won't. Yes, we kept asking them for the, the physical link, and they won't get it to us. So, this is a very, there. You know, again, the data that goes into this. How do they know? Did Did you fill it out? Did your partner fill it out? Did just Did your adult son fill it out? Because he happened to be living with you, and now you've got three people. You know, I mean, how, they they. It is very complex, and it's um, and there. And I would say that the process is still being developed there's a few things dates have changed since we started this process about three or four months ago and reached out to the US Census Bureau um, they're you know they're trying to work with what they can I'm sure after last night they're really making sure their technology is all in line well, that's super, the next super, question super is important that, you know I'm assuming you're gonna have 300 million people um, technically one. supposed to you know sign into a website yeah on in a 24-hour period yeah so this process actually started two years ago where that that um, online link has been tested um, over and over and they've been preparing for that yeah. many people going in um, they started like I said two years ago yeah awesome. well um, is there is there something with more detail because already um, we are the detail. Yeah, so we I are. We are. Yeah. I've gotten a lot of calls from yeah. seniors. Absolutely, and very, that's a huge. They actually, thing. you know, they want me to come there. And yeah. Maria the in the well, senior so. center, she is going to be dedicating their computer time, like they have computer classes, to like come. We will. We can't help anybody fill out the census, but we can a answer questions. Um, but yes, I mean, there's a ton of questions. Like I said, you know, they'll never ask for your bank account number. They'll never ask for your social security number. Like, what are the what are the scams that you need to watch out for? So we can get more detail from you guys. Yes, you know, yes, and, and 
we have a team that's also been going to uh, train the trainer program. So in addition, so the Mass Board of Library Commissioners is providing statewide training to all library staff, and they're also doing training the trainer. There are there are people training specifically town clerk staff. Um, Maria and her crew have attended the library training, but they are also um, a lot of senior centers and uh, elder human services departments are being um, approached to do physical training. And again, it's not training because we can't fill out the form for you, but it's all of that information because when you go to the website, it's like any other website. You get past one sentence and you, you forgot what your question is or you can't, it's not, it's not answering the question in the right way. So they are really reinforcing having the human component and being able to answer and explain not just why it's important, but you know, questions about safety, security, privacy, and all of that. So, and, and it is a fairly simple. I know some people who have taken that they were like early entries. Uh, it is, it, they're very simple questions. They're not hard. It's just, you know, if, especially if you live in a house with eight people, you got to answer the same questions about all eight people. And you have to make sure they're all counted. And maybe by the time they get to the four month old, they're just too tired and they don't want to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, babies are chronically, chronically undercounted. So, okay. That's cool. Um, Mark, could you just spend a minute and talk about re re precinct thing and what the time frame that would be and what it is? So the data is issued at the end of 2020, and then um, at that point the state takes that data and works with um, the town clerk's office and the GIS coordinator um, over the next year to work with the numbers and the mapping. And then in um, 2022, is when the final redistricting will be done, uh, and it'll at that at that point determine whether or not we need to redistrict the precincts and or add a precinct, depending on the way the numbers come out. Um, I'm sorry. What's the limit? Four thousand. Four thousand residents does not go by registered voters. You have to, we can only have four thousand residents within every precinct, and we have two precincts that are pretty close right now. So that's why I'm thinking we're going to end up adding another precinct by the time we get done with all the housing that's going in. And, mm -hmm. um, but we cannot go over the 4,000 within 10 years. So the plan is, is to make sure that between 2022 and 2032 that we do not go over that 4,000 count. Mm -hmm. So we have to account for any future plans in the next 10 years for growth within Reading. What happens if we go over in that time frame? At that point, then um, there's a mid during the mid 10 year period, they may end up adding. I don't know if you remember, and this was before my time. At one point, there was a precinct 8B added that was A and B, and that's the reason why is because they went over that 4,000. Mm. Um, so the hope is that that doesn't happen, but that's that's the way it would be handled is they would split up a precinct and go A. So and the B. impact to our local elections won't be. Um, will it be the 22 election for town meeting? 22, yep. 2022, yep. And you'll get that information. When will you have that information? Sometime during the year of 2021, all that information will be. So you'll have all the precincts laid out and who's, you know, who's on first, who's got to run, who doesn't have to Correct. run, and all that. Yeah, all that that's going to be a little chaos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did it in 2012, was the last time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in writing, we, we have to. We stand down the entire town meeting every time in ten years, so that's time to do it with this. Then the most rows getters get three years, the next get two years, and the least get one year within a precinct. Right. So the whole town meeting gets reformed to coincide with this. So the slate is wiped clean. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. No. And uh, exactly, it's, nobody's considered an incumbent at that point. Everybody, it's totally wiped clean and started over. And the Lord dil diligently counts by hand until two in the morning. <laughs> no yeah. technology. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Um, Laura, you mentioned something about, about the number of poll workers needed, and um, could you just give a brief update on that? And then also, if we're short, you said. Um, the state will supply the workers. How does that work? But I know it's two <laughs> questions. So f you know, first, or how, how how are the numbers looking? And second, if the state sends in workers, how does that work? So, um, I, so as of last night, um, we, we were 25 short in the morning and 24 short in the evening. 
Um, so let me kind of clarify what that means and, how, and when the state does step in. By, by law, I am required to have six poll workers um, per election per precinct. Ideally, we would have eight poll workers, I'm sorry, seven, I'm sorry, um, I'm losing my numbers here. We would have eight poll workers per precinct per election. So there would be 16 in every precinct for having a double election. And that, those numbers of us being short includes that eight. The state doesn't step in until we get below that six per election per precinct. And um, they generally don't step in unless uh, the town is on their radar. So Reading is not on their radar, thankfully, um, which means that they won't step in unless I call and say we need help. And, and what is stepping in? It, what do you mean by stepping that in? They would say that we need to send, we need to get other poll workers in place so that we have enough there. They would set, start sending people that would cost us quite a bit of money. Oh, that's what I wanted to hear. Yep. All so right. um, hopefully that won't happen. As of right now, being 25 short, we'll, we'll meet the guidelines to have six per election per precinct. It just, you know, if we have to stick to that, that means everybody's going to be working a little bit harder on longer day. Um, you want to make a pitch for how to apply and the benefits? <laughs> so um, it, it just call the office or um, come down and fill out a real quick application. Let me know that you want to be on the list. Tomorrow there'll be a letter going out to the current staff about letting them know their assignment. And then also, I, I, the unfortunate thing is because we have so many new people, they have to be trained. Um, I've all the train and uh, I've done seven, eight training sessions so far, and quite a few of them still need to be trained. So um, the letter that goes out will also include training dates. Uh, anybody that needs to sign up, again, will have to make sure they attend those training dates. The, uh, just call the office and let us know, and then you'll hear from me via letter with um, a schedule and um, welcome aboard. So the um, benefits is you get to sit with your uh, town residents and neighbors and have a good time and uh, work hard and um, fed very well and small amount of pay after for the efforts but it's um it's a it's a good time and what's the requirement must be a registered voter within the state of massachusetts um, we have we do have a couple coming from wakefield we have a couple coming from stoneham please don't tell my fellow town clerks <laughs> we also have one coming from hey. lynn <laughs> um so yeah it's a uh, so they don't have to be from Reading. No. Nope. People from outside can come join us. Correct. All right. There, had, there does have to be a percentage of Reading, but we're, at this point we're fine. Okay. Um, my biggest concern is usually when I send out the letters telling everybody their schedule, they start dropping out and saying they can't make it. Yeah. If that happens where we're, with the numbers that we're at right now, we're in trouble. So uh, please come, you know, the schedule is 630 to 2 or two to close, which is generally out of there by 9.30. Okay. Okay. So sign up, contact town clerk. We'd love to have you on election day. Most definitely. Amy, Laura, thank you both very much. Thank you. All right. So next up, we will be voting to close the uh, ward for the local election and the state primary. Motions. Bob, do you have any... Thing you want to uh, let's see. You have in your packet each. <clears throat> um, if you have any questions for Laura about the first one, uh, now's the time. And then I'll go into detail about the town meeting, annual town meeting warrant. Like so this is pages eight and nine of our packet yeah. that we're looking at right now. For the first one, that's for the uh, primary election. For the primary, yeah. yeah. And you should have a motion, Mark. I do. Yeah. Would you like a motion? Um, sure, you can read the motion, then if anyone has any questions. Move to close the warrant for the local election and state primary to be held on March 3rd, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Do we have questions for Laura? Okay. 
All those in favor? Thank you. All right. Um, now the warrant for annual town meeting. We can make the motion and we can have discussion if needed. Move to close the warrant for annual town meeting to be held on April 27th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Questions? Discussion? Okay. April town meeting is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, Bob, anything you want to highlight or point out? No, in my uh, overview of the meeting, I pointed out a few things. A lot of it is debt authorizations. Um, many of the items that are requested are in the enterprise funds. In fact, I think maybe all of them are in the enterprise funds, and they've been in the capital plan generally for a while. Um, with one exception, there's a downtown water main improvement that's uh, a little bit larger, and it incorporates some future work that had been planned uh, into the present. So otherwise, it's just, if you will, routine annual business. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Bob? No, thanks for the uh, information. All right. All those in favor? Great. Uh, next yes. up, we have been asked to appoint uh, a resident to the Board of Registrars. There was a letter in the packet for this. Let me just take a look. All right. Page 17. Yeah. Um, yes. She is here. She's here. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, I'm just going to read this letter. Um, it is coming from the chair of the Reading Democratic Town Committee. Um, Please let this letter serve as the Reading Democratic Town Committee's recommendation of Nancy Zimlick. Zimlick. Zimlick, thank you, uh, for the Board of Registrar's vacancy. Uh, our committee sincerely appreciates Nancy coming forward to take on this worthy endeavor and have confidence that she will faithfully perform the Registrar duties. Uh, do we have a motion and then have any questions in case anybody has any? Move to appoint Nancy Zimlack to the Board of Registrars for a term expiring June 30th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any questions? All those in favor? No, oh, I just thought maybe an explanation of how we how we do this in Reading. Ah. So people understand why we're appointing an explanation of appointing the Board of Registrar. Yeah, how we go about appointing individuals, yeah. So it's actually um, <coughs> Massachusetts. The uh, a Board of Registrar is recommend, it needs to be recommended by the Town Committee. Generally, they're, re they're involved with the Town Committee. Um, and then once the Town Committee uh, recommends, then at that point, the, the um, Select Board appoints as a formality. Okay. And we have four, you being one. Correct. Yeah. So, um, one thing that has been brought out in in the last ten years it, since, so the town, the uh, board of registrars is made up of four folks. One being the the town clerk. Generally, it's two members of the Republican Party and two members of the Democrat Party. The town clerk is the only one that's allowed to be an unenrolled voter, which I am. Um, so, just to be aware that the Board of Registrars has been slightly, un, has had two Democrats for the last 10 years and, and one Republican and one unenrolled. Just, just for your information. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Andy? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, all those in further? In, uh, in favor? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. You joined at the perfect time. All good, right. Good luck. No news. <laughs> no, no, no headlines. Uh, all right. That is set. So now we have a um, discussion on the fiscal year 21 budget. Bob, you wanted to give an update? Um, I'm just here to answer questions. Uh, the board has not really sent me any. I've, so I don't know where, quite where to go. Andy has, has sent out a comment today about a tree climber. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm happy to answer any of the board's questions or give whatever updates you would like. Okay. Um, so we can just open it up to the board if there's any budget-related questions. So, so I should explain the tree 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 climbing thing if you want to <coughs> first. Um, the, we're adding um, in Bob's proposed budget, um, adding uh, two uh, FTEs to town hall 
um, that is, uh, is proposed, uh, a second tree climber um, in DPW and a health benefits coordinator uh, or benefits coordinator um, within um, Treasury, within... Just, just to clarify, the yeah. board has only seen department head requests. Right. right. Um, the statement about it being in the town manager is not up to date. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So you're still working with this, but right. they the, still have the, a period of time to get out for FinCom. A couple weeks. Yeah. Right. Weeks. So I thought it's not due till the end. I'm certainly happy to update you specifically on the tree climber. Yeah. So, so um, I asked um, in order for the board to give input on the or what is it? Um, you know, consult. Uh, with you on this process. I asked for some information on the benefits coordinator and on the, uh, the second tree climber. And both Jane Kinsella, I, I am very grateful to Jane for putting together um, a good report on why we needed a second tree climber. And also um, to um, both the town treasurer and the town accountant for explaining the, why a benefits coordinator would be helpful. Um, and I think that the, I always look at this with the mind of extending, with an eye of extending the override money, making it last as long as possible and try not to add FTEs. Um, and uh, so the benefits coordinator, I, I was pretty convinced that um, we will actually, the town will actually make money uh, on this if we add this position and, or save money, I'm sorry, not make money, but save money. And uh, for the tree climber, second tree climber position, uh, the, the reasoning th that I was given was that um, if we need, sometimes we need uh, another tree climber on a large tree project and then she will pull someone from another um, division in, in DPW. And my thinking was that um, for now, if we could proceed with that, um, pulling from you know, the, the DPW has uh, 60 FTEs or something, um, continue to practice that way and, and save the town the addition of a, a, another FTE. So those were my thoughts. And, and so, you, but you came to a conclusion after. Yes. Yeah, so, so as I said at the last meeting, I think that the uh, benefits quarter is a coordinator is a true is a need, and um, I think that the second tri tree climber is a want that I understand, um, but I don't think it's really a need at this point from from what I can gather. Okay. Uh, Bob, I was going to, he was going to ask the question you were about to answer, which is, could you give us an update on Certainly. your thinking, please? <laughs> I never thought I'd be sitting here talking about tree climbers, but here we go. Um, I had indicated to Jane as soon as the RMLD news came out that that was not something that I was in favor of. Uh, she totally understood. She actually offered it up, so the benefits position was much more important. There were two requests from facilities for FTEs additions, and I believe I previously said to the board I was not in favor of those either, although they might be added at some point um, as the building security project sort of unfolded, because they were both related to that. Um, since I mentioned that to Jane, um, she's even now in a better shape because um, we lost a tree climber, our only tree climber, to another community for several dollars an hour more. Um, it was our loan program. He's asked to come back, so we're in really good shape. Um, so an excellent employee. We're really glad to have him back just this week. Uh, that's four. That's four for Jane on repo. Uh, lending employees out, see, you know, seeing what the more money and the work is like. And um, you know, the best part of that story is he came back because he likes to work hard and he appreciates the fact that in Reading, real work is done, and people don't just stand around and create work. So um, I'm very appreciative of that. So that means the need for a second tree climber is really a little bit less than it otherwise would have been anyways. But she understood. Um, I am going to ask uh, FinCom and then town meeting to put a little bit of money in the Parks and Forestry Department for a little more seasonal help. So that's at least a one-year 
assistance. And then depending what happens with our MLD, um, I've had discussions with the superintendent. Um, we're both preparing for, much as we did before the override every year, if we have to have layoffs, what do we want to do? Well, the first thing is you don't hire someone. You don't create a position unless you really have to. Um, and so on and so forth. So the budget you'll see out of me to FinCom and then ultimately uh, to on the town meeting has that theme. We want to make sure we have areas where we can identify reductions in the future years as, as we may need to. So that's the tree climber story. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Uh, other questions regarding fiscal year 21 budget? One of the things we had talked about was the historical information. I apologize if I missed this in an email regarding employment. I know Mark, you had FTE asked FTE counts. counts, not just current but previous few years. I don't recall seeing this. Did I? Well, miss that'll this? be in the final that'll be in budget. budget. Yeah. Okay. And I decided in the past few years it's been, if you will, buried in each department. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move it out of the departments and move it up front so you can see it all at once. I think that will just answer the question a lot more easily. Not just current FTEs, but historical? Going back a few years, yeah. Three, four, or five years. I'm not Great. sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yep. Uh, any other budget-related questions? Okay. Uh, we are... We have a hearing scheduled for 8.30. That is the next agenda item. However, um, since we're a little ahead of schedule, why don't we review the minutes? <coughs> this will be thrilling for those of you in the audience. All right. So, Mark, can you make a motion for the December 3rd minutes, and then we can review? I can. Move to approve the meeting minutes of December 3rd, 2019, as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So, I had one made minor edit. I don't I think it was this one. Does anyone else have any edits that they'd like to put forward? 2013. I do. I'm, I'm pulling it up. I think I, I did um, with one. Okay. I don't know if it's the right which one. Page 62 is where this one starts. At the back. And these are for December 3rd. Correct. So, um... I had sent some, in the packet are some some suggested revisions I had uh, in, for Caitlin. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at that. It's on page. It's right after the minutes. No. 66. It's, yeah. it's in the packet, yeah. Mostly just some clarifying things. Um, Those. I have a minor edit that I'm just <coughs> typing up now. And if you have one of yours, if you want to go. Sure. So it's in the third paragraph under leads on reports. Um, and I, uh, what it says is Ms. Landry noted Emmy Dobb on the Board of Health sent an email asking the select board to give feedback to them about the pesticide regulations. Um, I think what that was was she had sent an email informing the select board of what the Board of Health had done with the feedback we had provided them. Do you have that in writing and send it to Kate? Um, and then I have an edit. It is page four of the December 3rd, which is, which is page 65. Um, the sentence um, begins, Ms. Hubbard didn't go right about, just above the Mr. Doxer in bold. I'd suggest changing that to Mr. Friedman agreed that it felt as though we were treating homeowners differently than renters. <coughs> Anything else? Okay. Nope. 
All those in favor? Oh, sorry. So um, back to Andy's edits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Andy, I guess, is in favor. I'm, I'm, in, I'm okay with them. Is everyone else okay with mm -hmm. them as well? I'm okay. 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 All those in favor? Great. Sorry, but I wasn't there. Okay, you are not voting in. Uh, and Caitlin, please just note that John did abstain from that. Good. All right. So next up, we have mm, do we have a motion for December tenth, Mark. Move to approve the meeting minutes of December tenth, twenty nineteen, as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any edits? No, I, I didn't have I didn't have any. Okay. I will also I was absent this meeting, so I will abstain from this one. All those in favor? Great. That ate up three minutes. Fabulous. Um, Yes, Bob. I just retrieved uh, information for your Saturday meeting, if you'd like to review it. I think Great. that would be lovely. Thank you, Bob. Certainly. It was either that or just sit in my office for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a long break. Wait, is this clock actually <laughs> close to being right? It's, it's 8.03. Yeah. 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 So it's a lot closer. Fast. It's somewhat closer, yes. It's getting better. Awesome. It's not off by 20 minutes. <laughs> So um, earlier today, uh, I forwarded something from Jane Wellman um, describing sort of an organization of Saturday. Yep. Um, that was in an email, so I don't have that handy, but I'll do it from memory. She asked you to each bring in two things that other people don't know about you, and that should be a fun exercise, <laughs> and I'm going to watch, not participate. Um, and then she also, um, more importantly, asked um, each of your discussion points, she's called them goals, um, that you discussed a couple weeks ago are listed here. Um, you saw two versions. One is her raw notes. One, she tried to spruce it up a bit with editing, which I thought was a good job. Um, she is going to identify, I believe it's eight topics. I remember the first one was budget finance. I don't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. And then she is going to ask you to classify all of your goals as to where it belongs. So rather than her do that work, she thought it was better to ask you all the questions. You know, we've got three hours. So she's going to give you little stickies, go out, put them where they belong. Um, that'll be in the meeting. That'll be during the meeting. Right. Go ahead. Can I just add, just, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm looking at the mm -hmm. note, you're, you're spot on so far. Okay. One thing is to break the those eight items down into what's short term and what's long term. Right, and I'm not sure how she's going to accomplish that, whether that's a second step or part of the first step, but you're right. Then it is to divide the goals that you've classified into short or long term. And I'm, I'm not sure which way she's going to do it because you may disagree on one of you may say, you know, item X is short term and it belongs here. Another one may say, well, mine is long term and it belongs the same place. So she may want to wait for the discussion of short term, long term. And then once we've kind of organized um, all the goals and uh, got some sense of time frame, she wants to ask the board to prioritize. And that'll be much equivalent to the caucus last night in Iowa, I suspect. <laughs> Similar results? Yeah, well, let's hope not similar results. Let's say let's hope. When, when all is said and done, um, I'll try to record what I can for minutes. Um, she will, will probably be honest with me, taking pictures of things just to get the images that you've created or maybe just the hard copy itself. Um, she will then spend some time arranging and re reorganizing everything you've told her into another document that is then much more of a working document. So it is going to be very iterative, and there's going to be a lot of discussion. Uh, so I think the board will find it very helpful. Uh, just a housekeeping question. Mm -hmm. will, you, will you bring easels along for? I need to talk to her about that, and I wasn't sure what they so had, if anything, but I assume that we're going to have office supplies. Yeah, we'll be self-sufficient. So. Yes, we will. But where we, how the room gets set up, you know, if you want to use more wall space, yeah, I must set the room up a certain way. I just I sat down with her today just briefly and um, if it's possible we'd probably like to take a walk down there sooner than Saturday but there is an hour where the buildings open before you meet that we can also do it that morning well we can we can go anytime just okay. let me know in advance when you want to go I'll check with her then because I want her to be able to join us we generally we've done these sorts of things before we generally have pretty good office supplies yes. we can always borrow from the schools if we have to yeah, any time after tomorrow night is probably okay. Started. Thursday's Fine. Thursday's probably a good day. Okay. Yep. I'll check with her. Yeah, yeah we do. Okay. okay. So that that's. I'm sorry, it went so fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's your presentation. So, All right. With Correct the easels, yeah. do we have the sticky 
uh, yes. pads as well. Yep. Right. Okay. And will there be a talking stick? <laughs> Depends how rowdy we get it. <laughs> I'll bring a bat. I <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think Jane will have no trouble needing a bat to keep you all in line. Yeah. So. I, I have all the faith in the world in her. All right. Um, uh, let's discuss future agendas, and then we'll take a recess until 8.30 to begin the hearing. Um, oh, Lord. So there's a couple things that have come up since. Um, <coughs> there's a few items on here, which is the police chief um, process update, the town manager review, and the continuation of the parking, downtown parking and safety changes hearing. So we also have the potential to discuss RMLD um, and the ad hoc committee has requested time on that agenda as well. And well, I know we should have brought some of that stuff into tonight to tonight. Uh, apparently. Who um, knew? Best life plans. So because we're gonna be here till midnight with that agenda. But, uh, is that gonna be just is that the like maybe you know, the just goodbye tonight? <laughs> 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 but what we want to get to before you expire. So. What do they say? Swack? Is that how they say a kiss? In, in yeah, uh, swack. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's what the agenda looks like. I think all of it, um, that is a heavy agenda. And I think there are some that are very time sensitive. So it is possible that we may need to move one or two of those into March following the election. Um, I can work with Bob and, and see what makes sense. So what are you thinking? Um, I mean, I think we should do the town manager review. Um, I would say absolutely. That's six months overdue already. Exactly. Right. Uh, I think we need to, uh, with the ad hoc, I'd like to fit them in because there are members of the school committee who will not be members of the school committee after the election. Right. Um, and so it would be nice to be able to have them there when, if we choose to move forward with a vote to institute the recommendations from the ad hoc. So I think a half hour should be 20 minutes, half hour? I think so. The presentation be should be brief. I don't know how, what questions you might have, okay. but the, yeah. the presentation I think should be brief. Okay. We have a um, mission and a, and a, and a pr proposed structure. Okay. Um, so the town manager review, the ad hoc, and RMLD are all must-haves on this. Um, high up there is the police chief update. I, I think the and police chief has to be in. in so my, what I'm thinking is, if if possible, if we um, continue the hearing for parking and move that to March. Um, the question there, and we can ask once we start the hearing, ask the staff is what their timeline is for implementation. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good question. I haven't thought of that yet, so we'll have to ask when, when Julie's yeah, here. Because I the think some of the items would be difficult, but I'm sure some of them are fine. The, the concern there is that if they're being asked to implement these, to implement these changes right. by July 1, are we giving, if we push until March and there's additional discussion, do they have enough time to implement them? And uh, we just, yes, Bob. I, I would suppose, you know, Julie will be mad at me later, but I would suppose that we could pick it up. Your next meeting isn't until March 17th, so it's a bit of a gap. Right. Um, but I don't see any reason why the board couldn't tackle whatever it needs to tackle that night, and then if things can't be done by July 1st, that's okay. We'll just pick a logical time where they can be done. There's no, I mean, we do have permits that expire June 30th, but that can be remedied. You can do another six months, as we discussed last fall. Okay. So there is a solution. You know, we could work around that. Okay. So I see that one being the one that gets... Yeah, and I think you can, I think it's protocol says you could leave it in and then if time for, you can open True. and then continue, in other words, that could be literally a three minute exercise if it had to be. But if we could, if there's time, we can take care of as much of it as we can and then, yeah. you know, the continuation can go on. Yeah, my only pause is, you know, as we saw with the 
number of people that have been emailing us mm -hmm. today and the people that are going to be here today. I, if we're having a hearing, I'd like to make sure that we actually have the hearing, even if it's continued, because if people come, right, you know, that they're, they're coming to speak. If we, so today being an exception, but we generally tend to run over. Um, so I think pushing it to March might make more sense. But I can I talk to Bob what he thinks time wise we might well, need. I think we're going to a lot of. I'm <coughs> and, and you will need to make that decision tonight so. when you continue the hearing. If you continue the hearing, okay. you have to continue it to a date certain and a time certain. <coughs> so then let's see what progress we make tonight, and then base it off of that. And I'll go have a quick chat with Julie just to see if she has any okay. thoughts. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, in one one thought, I think for the police chief topic, um, I'd like to. Um, it's such an important decision for the town, and um, a long term decision for the town um, that I'd like the residents to be able to have an opportunity to speak up and um, sh share their their views on the topic. I think that's important that we we, we take that into account. So, um, and it's also during school vacation week. Uh, so perhaps we could. The eleventh is the following. It says following yeah, we work school, that school, school vacation, school week, vacation is week is two seventeen. I apologize. Yep. Yeah. So, so if we could allow sufficient time for for residents to comment after after um, mm -hmm. Bob presents on that I think that would be uh, I'd like to see that if we could include allow enough time for that yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll work with Bob to make sure we can fit those four priorities in. <laughs> good luck and that, yeah thanks uh, all right so why don't we take a 15 minute adjournment and we will reconvene at 8 30 with the parking hearing
Thanks everyone, welcome. Um, so we have a hearing now for downtown parking and other safety changes. The way we're going to start this is we have two um, uh, items that are safety related, not related to the downtown. So we'll start with those. We'll have presentations um, by public safety and then we will move on to the downtown parking area. As they are all in one hearing notice, if Mark you could read the hearing notice. To the inhabitants of the Town of Reading, please take notice that the Select Board of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on February 4th, 2020 at 8.30 p.m. in the Select Board's meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, to discuss potential modifications to the downtown parking system and other changes that may result in amendments to the Town of Reading traffic and parking regulations as follows. Improve traffic safety at the intersection of Pine Ridge Road and Oak Street by adding a placement of an isolated stop sign pursuant to Article 6.12. Amend Article 5.13, Reserve Parking at Pleasant Street Center. Amend Article 5.9, No Overnight Parking. Amend Article 5.14, Leased Parking Program for Merchants and Employees. Amend Article 5.2.1, Regarding the Employee Parking Sticker. Amend Article 5.2, Regarding the Reading Community Access Sticker. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the Town Manager's Office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and will be in the Select Board packet on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 12 p.m. on February 4th, 2020 to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lalasher, town manager. Thanks, Mark. Um, there is seating up front if anyone would like to grab them. Uh, um, um, could, oh. I just want to orient, orient us to uh, the place in the packet for yeah. us. This is, I think it's, it starts on page 19. Yes. Um, some of it is, but the first couple items are in the packet that was handed out to you tonight. Got it. You've seen previously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes. Good evening. Um, Lieutenant Bill and City Officer Mike Scouten. Um, the first item that we have for you is um, to actually make official the Pine Ridge Road stop sign. It actually already is there. It was put up as a temporary stop sign during the MWRA um, construction project. So we think it's been there long enough now, the residents are used to it, it wouldn't make sense to take a stop sign down at this point. So for safety, we would ask that you um, would amend that and vote the Pine Ridge Road stop sign in to remain for the safety reasons there. Thank you. Um, the second one, we've had um, a lot of issues this past few years at the Pleasant Street Center. Um, there's a, in the traffic rules and regulations, there's three exceptions to the overnight parking. There's three parking lots. The Senior Center is one of them, the Brandy Court lot, and um, the Hardin and Yard lot. All of a sudden, there's a lot of cars using that overnight exception, and the DP we have two problems here. The DPW can't plow it when they need to, and also um, the Senior Center, um, people coming to use the Senior Center can't park there as well. Um, we've had a hard time tra tracking down everybody in the morning time. We don't know what time they got there and how to get them out. So we would ask that, and then also in the Senior Center lot, there's actually four different regulations, but none of them are actually in the tra tra traffic rules and regs. There's different signage. Um, one has two lease spaces. One has one section back here. It is two hour or employee only. And then this says for patrons of the Senior Center only. So it's hard for us to regulate who's coming and going. So we would ask that the Senior Center be allowed to regulate their own lot and have it for patrons only and no overnight parking um, because people aren't leaving there in the morning and the DPW cannot plow the lot overnight. Um, the other two lots that we're having a problem with, especially at the Brandy Court lot, is those that are parking overnight. The um, employees that are par purchasing employee parking stickers are getting there and their overnight cars are still there. So they're purchasing stickers and they can't park there because the overnight parks are there, as well as the DPW is having a problem plowing these lots because of the overnight exceptions. So we would ask that you take away these overnight exceptions from these lots. Thank you, Lieutenant. Any questions from the board? I will say that there's one house in Reading without a driveway and they're allotted their own two parking spaces on the street. So we do make exceptions for that one house. So everybody else should have parking. Any other okay. questions from the board? Bob? Just as a comment for those that weren't on the board, um, when the MWRA project came forward, 
we described it as this would likely be a permanent thing, but let's see how it works. <coughs> it seems to have worked very well. Uh, you mean the Pine Ridge Road? I'm sorry, the Pine Ridge Road stop sign. Stop sign. The okay. very first thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, can we actually have a little bit more background as to um, why that was implemented and uh, if we've seen improvement, presumably, there? Uh, which one, sorry? Uh, Pine, Pine Ridge, Ridge Road. Yeah. Um, I was, Ryan, do you have anything on that? I, I can do some oh, of that. Sorry. Um, sure. Uh, when the MWA was tearing up West Street and Oak Street, they had to detour traffic for some significant amounts of time. So the, the, all the West Street traffic was being redirected down there and then just dashing right out onto Oak Street while they were working on West Street. And it was really very unsafe. As, as you know, Oak Street's a pedestrian in, in the neighborhood. Um, and um, at the time, we also discussed that it wouldn't be a bad long-term improvement even after the detour traffic went away. But that was the immediate need for it. Um, any other questions for the board on any of these suggestions? Okay. So just thinking for a minute about <coughs> overnight parking. So the, the request we have here is no overnight, period. How many cars have, have been in these lots in the past? Is it 10 or 15? Is yeah, it 50 about or 60? That. No, about 10 to 15 um, that I've seen. Do we know why they park there? Parking, but I, I don't know if they're guests, uh, so they're extra cars, or if they just don't want to move cars in the morning in the driveway. I don't, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. So it's easy, right? Yeah. You go there, it's easy. It's a lot of yeah. I know. They park there because they can't. Right. Um, I mean, you know, that's kind of what's going on. I, th I think what's right. going on. That might be. So I personally responded to a few calls over there, yeah. and um, it's it's kind of embarrassing when you show up and there's multiple cars in the lot covered with snow, uh, especially at the senior center. The seniors there trying to use the senior center plates to try to pull in the park. And we're running around running plates, trying to knock on doors, trying to track down these people. And when you get out there, you knock on one door, you head to another door, and you go back, and the person hasn't come out of the house yet. So it's just very, very frustrating. The seniors are parking on Pleasant Street, struggling to get down the street, you know, the snow banks, we're turning them away. It's just, it's it's not, uh, it's it's being abused. It's not being utilized before it originally was meant. And we've actually ticketed them in the morning when they haven't left, and they continue to park there and just gain more tickets, some of them. So our, so we have to, again, go to their house and ask them to move. Okay. What will the enforcement be, assuming we vote to make these no overnight parking? So that makes it very easy for the officers because there's no overnight exceptions in any town lot, and so they'll know that they can ticket them at least. So they'll just be ticketed on a nightly basis? Mm -hmm. Right now, it's just a $20 fine, yes. Okay. So the overnight exception will come in, but they still park in these lots at night without use the square um, if they just can't park. Right, it would be from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. Any other questions from the board before we open it up to the public? Public comment then on the Pine Ridge Road stop sign at Oak Street or the overnight parking ban proposed. Okay, seeing none. Um, we will vote on these particular items. Um, we will not be voting on the downtown parking uh, recommendations at this time. We will be reopening the hearing in March, or re-advertising it, excuse me, um, for March. The purpose for the downtown hearing presentation um, and hearing is to hear from the community and the local businesses on the current suggestions. So with that in mind, um, we'll leave the hearing open, but we will move to approve these particular recommendations. Should I do them one at a time? Yes, please. Okay. Move to approve safety amendment 2020-1 as proposed. Second. Okay. And just to clarify, that is the Pine Ridge Road stop sign at Oak Street. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Great. Move to approve safety amendment 2020-2 as proposed. Second. Thank you. Uh, and this is uh, to uh, prevent overnight parking at the Pleasant Street Center. Further discussion? Several of them. Yeah, yeah I'll prove oh, is that possible? Street, it's Pleasant Street, it's Brandon Court. Oh, okay. Uh, so that will be Pleasant Street Center, 
Sorry, this is 2020-2, which is which specifically is that's um, just pleasant. pleasant so that Street would be Center for the, the lot to just be for patrons only. Right. No employees, ah, no okay. um, visitors. So, as far as um, all right, so we have a motion. We have a second. I have a question on that. Is there a concern for employee parking in that lot if we remove that? It didn't look like many employees were using it. Um, that back corner seems to be pretty empty during the day, um, throughout the day, back and forth, not okay. in the morning, but. Okay. Um, and nobody rents the lease spaces there, so. Okay, great, thank you. Andy? I just had a, a possible contradiction with the, the next one. It says uh, they can, um, it's reserved for employees and patrons, et cetera, et cetera, 24 hours a day, seven days oh, a yeah, week. So should that be a Yeah, it should not be from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Right, no overnight. I yeah. Say. yeah um, I, mm -hmm. Well, then from 6 a.m. to 1, 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. or something like that, okay. amend it to uh, from 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. to 1 a.m. Seven days a week? Seven days a week, yeah. Wow. Does that make sense, Bob? Yeah. Sounds good. Nice question, Andy. Thank you. Yeah. There's seats up front. Feel free to come on over. There's chairs on the side over there, too. Right? So. Um, all right. So we'll call that a friendly amendment. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Great. Move to approve safety amendment 2020 3 as proposed. And this is the one that will. Oh, sorry, do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, and this will abolish overnight parking at the Pleasant Street Center lot, the Hardin Yard parking lot off of Pleasant Street, and the Brandy Court Municipal parking lot off Haven Street. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Great. Do we have more? Okay. Um, stop. Yeah, right. that, that's all. Are those, that's Please. all for you, that's correct? It, yeah. Fabulous. Thank you, Lieutenant Officer. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Um, so now we will have a brief presentation um, by Julie Mercer regarding the proposed changes to downtown parking. For those of you watching at home, we are on page 19 of tonight's packet. So, thank you for having me back. Um, I'll start by just handing out a couple <coughs> documents that were provided to you in your packet, but so you can have them in front of you tonight. Um, the first one I'll hand around is the parking inventory that was confirmed by the Town Engineering Division. Um, and the second one is a memo from our consultant, Nelson Nygaard, regarding um, nuts and bolts of implementing kiosks in public lots. So I'll just give a quick overview for the audience tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the third time that I've met with the select board in the past few months regarding the downtown parking system. I gave them a brief presentation in October of 2019 to talk about you know, some things we were thinking of for the downtown parking system. And then in January, I presented them with those same thoughts, but furthered a little bit. Um, in the meantime, between October and January, we did um, conduct a downtown parking survey, which we distributed in a variety of ways to um, downtown businesses, property owners, employees, um, merchants, and we did get a pretty good response to it. And then staff also did a lot of door-to-door, -door, one on one um, outreach with businesses as well. So we appreciate all the feedback we got. We've seen a number of emails come in in the last week from many of you, and we appreciate all that feedback as well, and we'll try to incorporate as much of it as we can into our system redesign. 
So just to give you some of the highlights, it's a cross-disciplinary staff team that's working on this effort. So the things that you're hearing tonight are things that have been fully vetted through the police department, the DPW department, um, economic development staff, town management staff. So they're not just coming from me, I'm just the, the voice. <laughs> um, there were a variety of sources used, including the feedback we got from the survey. Um, so, on the screen, but basically, just to give you an idea, and I know you all live and experience this every day, um, but we have our downtown parking area, which is you know roughly 0.1 of a square mile, and within that um, really small area, we have two dozen ways of regulating parking. So. We understand that that's really hard to navigate and really frustrating for almost any type of user, whether you're an employee, a business owner, a resident, a commuter. Um, it's very difficult to navigate the way it's currently arranged. Um, and so that I tried to capture that in this slide here where I say, what is the user experience of this? In general, the user experience is frustrating. And we know that and we hear that at almost every time we have a public meeting um, about almost any topic we hear. Parking is a big problem. So. Um, the, the opportunities for consideration, these are what I presented in October to this board, um, trying to align them with a guiding philosophy for, um, you know, the way we approach this downtown this parking system overhaul. So the philosophy that we, you know, came up with as an interdepartmental staff group was, has three basic components. The first one is to expand access and really align the supply with the demand, simplify the system, and have the spaces available to multiple different user types. Um, the second is to level the permit playing field. So we know that you know a lot of businesses maybe purchase employee permits, but there maybe aren't enough employee permit spaces. So that's frustrating. So we want to look into ways to increase the number of permits and expand locations for employee parking. And then the third um, general aspect of our philosophy is to empower the user versus penalize the user. And by that, what we really mean is to allow people to pay to stay as long as they want, rather than parking and waiting and hoping they don't get a ticket and maybe getting a ticket if they're running five minutes late. So I know a number of cities and towns in this area, including the one I live in, I pretty much pay wherever I park you know, anywhere in town all the time. Um, so I know that, you know, paying to park is something that would be new to Reading, but it's not really new to other towns of this size in this area. So um, fast forwarding a little bit, we, we asked the select board for additional time to kind of study the situation. We put out the survey, um, and I presented some of the survey results to the select board in j January. Um, the highlights are here. The survey was open for about a month. We distributed it in a variety of ways. We spoke in person with 55 businesses. Um, we heard from 52 different entities, different businesses, business owners. Um, individual business response was 47, which is about 30% of the downtown businesses total. Um, we heard from those of you who responded, about 70% of you have fewer than 10 employees. Um, about 50% of respondents have fewer than four employees at the busiest time, um, and about 75% of respondents have a typical shift of eight plus hours. So all this feedback that we got from the survey is really important to us as we consider like how we would modify the system. Um, so then, you know, we asked for feedback on the employee permit program. We um, less than 50% of the respondents to the survey use the employee permit program. Um, and f for a variety of reasons, in some cases it's because businesses don't know about it or don't need it because they have their own off-street parking lots. Um, or they tried to use the program but there weren't any permits available at the time they went to the police department. And then some other feedback we got is that the program's too expensive, the spaces aren't guaranteed, you pay for a permit but you come to downtown Reading and you still can't find a space because all the spaces are taken. Um, and then, you know, walking, a, a, you know, a few blocks if you're carrying a lot of stuff may not be ideal depending on what type of business you have or what, you know, type of job you have. Um, so we looked at, you know, how many permits and um, employees or businesses are purchasing and how many they said they needed in this survey and we found out that employees were purchasing between about you know five to nine um, and the typical business needed about you know between four to six maybe so we thought if we cap the number of permits and I know I, I believe in 20 
19, maybe 20, 20, the number was capped at five initially, <coughs> um, which may, may have been a change for some of you that you, you know, from, from prior years. But we, when we look at the data that we got about the businesses downtown and we hear about, you know, how many employees you have and how many employees you have in your largest shift, we think capping the number of permits per business somewhere between five and 10 should cover most of the businesses downtown. Um, of course, there are always going to be outliers. One of the things we're envisioning is, is starting with a cap to let, you know, as many businesses as, you know, we can participate and then when there's, you know, leftover supply, if there's leftover supply, opening it back up to people who need, businesses who need more. Um, we can get into that in a little more detail. But, so we got some open-ended feedback from um, you, you know, about how we could improve or expand the employee permit program. And I, it looks a little bit small, um, but basically the comments that are in red on the screen are things that we think that we're addressing through the proposed changes. Um, the comments in blue are things that we could consider, and then the comments in black are, such as building a parking garage, are probably not within our budget for the upcoming year. Um, so we, we also asked you, you know, where, where you park, where your employees park. Um, and it's important to note that even without an employee permit, 45% of respondents still use the public lots and use the public on-street spaces. So, um, you know, I, I'm imagining that is in a variety of ways. So if you're a person without a permit and you're parking on the street, you maybe you're moving your car every two hours, um, which isn't really convenient. Um, but with or without an employee permit, we heard that, you know, uh, we, we asked for specific streets of where employees park and some of the feedback we got really strengthens the case for some of the things we're proposing. So we tried to align like what we were hearing with what we would propose so as best as we could. So now getting into the real meat of the presentation, um, the opportunities that I'm going to talk about tonight, which I've reviewed with the select board. Um, uh, there's a few different types. There's some surgical fixes to discrete problems. Um, then there's you know, system-wide system -wide modifications, and then there's some implementation actions that are things for them to really think about you know, as, we, as we think about implementing the system. So surgical fixes to discrete problems. Number two, they just did through the police department's request, and that was related to the Pleasant Street Center lot, so we can, um, and actually number three as well. So you've done two of the the three surgical fixes on this slide already. Number one, it regards the leasing program. Um, and so what we're proposing as an interdepartmental staff group is that the leasing program be abolished. The reason for abolishing the program, we see it, is because it would eliminate the privatization of public space and increase the public supply. So there are 58 public spaces that we currently lease to approximately 10 different private entities. And so if the person who's leasing it isn't using it, nobody else can use it ever. So that's really taking it away from the, the public supply of parking. So what we want to do is add those 58 spaces back into our public parking supply and allocate them you know, as they would be depending on where they are ge geographically. And I'll get to a map later that kind of breaks that down. So we also heard from survey respondents that most respondents weren't using the leasing program and um, when we asked if they wanted it, you know, about half of respondents weren't even, weren't interested in it. Um, so that would be one surgical fix for consideration. And then the second page, we, the second slide of surgical fixes um, talks about the resident community access sticker and there are two components of this. Um, the first one is, you know, eliminating the free option. I mentioned here um, that, you know, and I think the uh, police um, department mentioned earlier tonight that, you know, there's one or there's two impacted properties that um, do not have dedicated off-street parking and that, um, so the, the ability for those residents to park on-street would remain, um, the free sticker could, could remain for, the, for them, I would think. Um, but basically what we don't know really is that the resident only areas downtown it's hard to tell if the spaces are used by the downtown residents um, or if they're used by other residents who park downtown to use the commuter rail um, so, so parsing out our utilization data based on that we haven't done um, so I'm not really sure um, 
I've heard anecdotally that, you know, so the resident permit is available to any resident who has a resident restriction along their property frontage, right? So that's the free permit. Um, and I've heard anecdotally that the residents downtown will get that so that they can park there, so that no one else can park there. Maybe they don't necessarily need to park there, but just so they don't have other people parking in, along the street. So that's anecdotal. I don't know if that's, that's factual or not. Um, and then it also does seem that it's possible that a number of commuters from all around town are using the resident permit and parking there all day to commute downtown. So those are spaces that are right in our inner core of downtown that are being taken all day long by people who maybe aren't patronizing businesses. Um, so this, this surgical fix of removing the free option is not as critical um, if, you, if you like the um, removing the resident only regulations in the downtown and which is coming in a further slide so um, and then the second piece of this is unbundling it which we need to I would suggest we do a little more research into what impact that will have before we take action on that so um, that would be a future future thing so, okay so now getting into the reason the real reason probably many of you are here is the, the overall system-wide modifications um, and our guiding you know strategy here was we're focusing on the downtown north, which I have a map, and I'll show you so you'll understand these terms. Um, no changes to the downtown south. Um, let the mapping and the data tell the story. So we looked at the regulatory maps, we looked at utilization data, and we looked at survey data. And we really like tried to like tease out from that, like what is our story? Like where do we want to go with this system? Um, and then capitalizing on the existing framework. So by that I mean that we're looking to, to modify make modifications within existing regulated areas. So if you're used to having regulations near where you work or live, you know, th those are the areas we're looking at. We're not necessarily looking, looking at expanding regulations too far beyond what the already regulated area. Um, and then to that second point, formalizing our additional areas or spaces only as needed. So, you know, some of these, these changes you know we might characterize them as small changes um, but we do think they will have a big impact um, and and maybe an acute impact to the immediate user or person who's used to parking somewhere where they may not be able to um, with these changes okay so this is the map that kind of shows the um, terminology that I'm using and I don't know is it is it clear is it easy to see to, can I turn this light off yeah oh. Does that work? Is that better? You could probably blow okay. it up a little bit. Yeah, blow it up a little and then you can move it around. Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you need to show the south, and then you can yeah. you know, slide it up. Good. It's a lot easier to see. Okay, so basically what I'm referring to as the downtown north is the area that's entirely above, like the area above the tracks, right? So this blue line that's bisecting the map, the area above is the downtown north, and then the area below is the downtown south all this area right here. So the focus of these changes is the downtown north. Um, no changes are proposed to the downtown south. Within the downtown north, um, we have the inner core, which is this area here that's like highlighted in orange, and what I'm calling the outer core, which is the area that's like one or two, one or two blocks emanating you know, from the inner core. Could you tell people the streets where you have that yellow line, yep. for example? That'll make it easier to understand. Yeah. So the yellow line um, is Woburn Street here. I know, sorry, I, I look at maps all the time, so that's a great suggestion. <laughs> um, so the, it's, it's um, Woburn Street, Main Street, and High Street is this yellow area. And the yellow is actually not including any spaces on Woburn Street. Woburn Street is, in fact, highlighted in pink um, and is considered part of the outer core. Um, from my terminology here. So yeah, so outer core is like these little pink, um, you know, little coming out here. And then the inner core is this area bounded by Woburn High and Main Street. Okay, so. Um, one thing that we had talked about last time I was here was really trying to understand how many spaces we have downtown and how many spaces we have in the inner core and the outer core. And so um, it was really like awesome that you know right after this meeting and before, right after I met with you last time and before I prepared this for the packet, the engineering division really rallied to like 
ground truth the information provided by um, the consultant and they made quick work of it and they put it in this like gorgeous spreadsheet for me I was really happy um, so but long story short um, you know the consultant in some areas like double counted some things or counted some private parking um, what engineering did is they went out and they um, they verified the, the spaces that are actually striped and then in areas where spaces aren't striped they conservatively estimated what could be possible there so you know like if they're not striped and you have a bunch of smart cars you're gonna fit a lot more than if they're not striped and you have a bunch of Hummers or whatever but they you know they use conservative methodology um, and so what we came up with with the inner core is about 550 spaces and within the outer core, about 330. And I handed that out for you so you could look at it more closely. Great, thank you. Sure. <coughs> so now getting into um, some of the proposed changes that would impact customer parking. Uh, down here. So what we're proposing <coughs> for customer parking is to have the inner core area, which is all these streets highlighted in yellow, which um, currently, and you can see in the green, green means public two hour. Um, and we're proposing actually to keep these areas as public two hour. And then like this stretch here along Linden Street, which is resident only, would also be turned into public two hour. The area here along Gold Street, which is um, currently employee, I think it's public two hour or employee parking, the employee piece would be moved and it would just be all public two hour. So having the downtown public two hour means it's, it's available to all different user types. If you're, if you're a resident, you could park there for two hours. If you're patronizing a business, you could park there for two hours. If you're an employee, you could park there for two hours. You could move if you wanted um, every two hours. It was open to anyone for two hours. Just to be clear, like Gold Street, for example, that's got 21 on the on this form, really doesn't, because like 12 or 15 are currently consumed by construction. Right. So Gold Street is in flux right now um, yeah. because those spaces are taken by the construction project. So I just wanted to be clear that the, the thing you gave us that you had just <coughs> the spreadsheet, which really simplifies things a lot. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> is, isn't it when everything is <clears throat> there's no construction going on this is what it looks like right. that's and correct however it is different than that right now yes okay got it yes that's correct um can you also clarify for the two hour parking is it two hour all day in the sense that if an employee moves their car will they be ticketed because my understanding is that the current rules are it is you are allowed one car in the downtown area for two hours and if you move if you're there for two hours and you move it someplace else you've outstayed your two hour limit and you now you will be ticketed i think that it's possible that it has been enforced that way at times in the past but that it's also possible that you could move your car every two hours and not be ticketed the police department maybe could Chime in yeah, on so that. We, we kind of reread the traffic board and regs to see how we actually determined it, and we don't think it's very clear that. So we now basically allow people to move after two hours because we said, what if you go home for two hours, come back for another walk for two hours? So we haven't been enforcing any two-hour rules if you've been moving spaces. So the time is that in the inner core? Correct. In the inner core. And anywhere that has a two-hour limit. Um, okay, because that because a lot of people had there's been enforcement. Mm -hmm where you know you move your car it's two hours on haven you and then you move to ghoul right. and you get the ticket mm -hmm. in the third you know when you're in your first hour of being on ghoul right. because you're in the zone so we, you're you stopping that now you go to another spot it was stopped because there's also it made no sense you, that means for a rain resident couldn't shop in downtown for more than two hours right so if you have a dentist appointment and that's why an hour and a half and then later on you're waiting for someone to lunch and you park in downtown, that means you couldn't then go to lunch in downtown or anything, you couldn't right. shop. So, in reading the traffic rules and regulations, it's not enforceable anyway. So, it's been if you move the car as long as it's not in the same spot, you're within. That's so really important to know. I don't know. Bob, 
And just to be clear, those enforcement actions were directed by the prior town manager and a prior board to, for the police to do what they used to do. A long ago prior board. A long ago prior so, More than six years ago. Board. Absolutely. What do our current rules say is the enforcement, and will the new suggested rules address that so that we don't put the police in a situation where they have to interpret? I, right, I would suggest that the new rules reflect exactly what the board wants. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want two hours in a spot and you can move around, make yes. sure it says that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, we're gonna we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the full presentation and then we'll lay out some ground rules for public comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is the customer parking situation that we're proposing, um, and I I think um, I mentioned we have calculated that there are about 550 spaces um, right in the inner core. Um, and then I've mentioned that this Gould Street, Gould Street resident that doesn't have off-street parking would still be able to have a resident permit um, and yep. park there. So that would not change. Uh, Julie, um, mm -hmm. sorry, um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. It, it, so it looks like within this zone, um, you're still allowing for all day with uh, employee permit? Or, or am I misreading the key? So in um, in the zone that I've highlighted in orange, it would be public two hour or public thirty minutes. In some in some cases, we do have some thirty minute spots. Um, this is the customer parking map that just shows the inner core. Okay. Um, oh, I, I see. Okay. Okay. And one key component of this, which I almost forgot to mention, is that we are also proposing to add um, pay by pay by plate kiosks in the two public lots, so in the CVS lot and the Brandy Court lot. Um, and some of the logic behind kiosks is um, it helps with util with turnover um, if you're you know asking people to pay. Um, it empowers users to pay and stay and not worry about getting a ticket. Um, and it is proven to, to help with turnover. And so we can talk a little bit more about like the nuts and bolts of kiosks as we get further into this, but that would be something we are proposing for the lots here. Um, okay. So then moving along to employee parking, um, what we're suggesting here is um, relocating the Gould Street area that's right in the inner core where it's employee parking to along here on Woburn Street and basically just expanding the overall supply for employees. Um, so all of these pink highlighted areas would become public two hour or all day with employee permit. Um, and we estimate there are about 330 spaces total. Whereas right now we give out 145 employee permits for about 120 spaces. Um, so we could, you know, add around 200 spaces to the supply um, and increase the number of permits accordingly. So Julie, I have a question. Mm -hmm. huh? Are those just not being used? Is that what we understand? I mean, we're not, we can't invent space. It's just mm -hmm. there and not being used, or it's currently a no parking zone, or maybe you could yeah, explain yeah. that a little bit more. That's a great question. So the areas that are highlighted, like here in pink, where my like on Green Street here, where it shows um, gray underneath the pink highlight, gray indicates that it's unregulated. <coughs> that it's what unregulated, and so that doesn't mean that people aren't using it, but it's. Um, it's it's not you know so, so we do have utilization maps that show that throughout the day and they they looked at a thursday an average thursday and an average tuesday and throughout those days these areas that are you know just a couple blocks outside of downtown aren't highly utilized um so on this this side here on east of main street and then also up here sort of north of woburn street um and then over here which you know um we're not proposing really any changes to this area, but you know, down here and th these on these side streets, Prescott um, and Pratt, the utilization is is pretty. So low. signs will go there that say 
two hour or employee all day. Right. I mean, so that would be. That is that what would happen? That that would be what would happen if you agree to, to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. You were, I thought you were not proposing any changes for uh, south of the. Right. I'm room. not. So <coughs> I so to answer like John's question more specifically, mm -hmm. we. we if you agree to expand the employee permit, like locations where they can park, we would add signage to the streets that are highlighted in pink um, and change the regulations. So like, uh, for example, here on Woburn Street, we have green, which is right now public two hour, and that would change to public two hour or all day with employee permit. Right. So we could increase the areas where employees can park by you know, 200 plus spaces. And, and so that's how you're getting the extra employee spaces yes. by allowing them to be there with it all day. Right. That's okay. right. Got it. Um, and it's really, they're really just one to two blocks outside of the inner core. Um, and it's areas where employees currently park. So we have employee parking right here on Woburn. We have employee parking um, here on Haven Street, some here on Chapin. So, you know, we would add you know, where feasible and engineering helped with that, you know, determination of like where spaces could be feasible and fire trucks could still get through, um, you know, we would add signage um, and, and or stripe if that's something that you're interested in um, to formalize spaces to those areas. Is there a recommendation for striping versus not at this point? So if we were to agree to all of this, let's say, would striping take place at that point? So I think we would have to analyze it on a street by street basis, but I would say like in general when you stripe it, you know, you're striping a 20 foot long space, like if you did have employees with smart cars, you're now restricting like how many people can park there. However, if you don't stripe, you're also relying on people to park to use Perfect. good judgment, <laughs> I guess we'll call it, while parking. So it's a little bit of, mm -hmm. you know, I mean. You could use those cars to park themselves, right? <laughs> right. So Wicked cool. I, I always talk about I used to drive a smart car, so I, you know, and I used to be that person that would like if someone was pulled up forward in a space I could like squeeze behind them and the enforcement doesn't know who got there first. <laughs> you, you know, I mean <laughs> did that for five years, it was great. Um, so I always talk about smart cars, but anyway. Um, so so it's I guess it's just, you know, it's a it's a topic for converse for further conversation whether we should formalize them or not but that's how you get in the spaces is the point you device you're using different signage right different signage um and, which and explicitly allows <laughs> employees to park yep. Yep. all day yep. all day right, right. <clears throat> and then of course we would increase the number of permits for issuing accordingly mm -hmm. um so that's so that's that, and then if you put the two together, you get this map that shows customer and employee parking, and it's all the same, it's just in, on one map. And then yeah. this slide here, which is gonna be impossible to read if I zoom out, but basically this is the slide that kind of puts everything in one place and talks about, the, outlines the geography at the top and what the, regula the regulations are, and then talks about how it will impact the different users and components of the system. Um, and as I noted last time, the things that are highlighted in red are like the open questions, things to think about, decisions that can be made that, you know, may or may, or may not, however you make them, you know, you could still adopt this, these system-wide changes, you know, and then, like it won't make or break the system if you offer the employee permits for free or not. Um, but we do, staff, we do have opinions about what you should do in those instances. And that's further down when we talk about implementation decisions. We have, a, I have a couple of things here where I ask, you know, for decisions to be made. So the employee permit fee or no fee is one of them. And highlighted in bold is, you know, what we think from a staff perspective. You know, if we're saying employees park one to two blocks outside of the downtown, you know, it would incentivize it and make it seem more appealing maybe if it were offered for free. Um, the other thing is if, if we're going to charge for spaces in the lots, um, you know, like I think that it'll help 
incentivize employees to park a couple blocks away <coughs> versus paying in the lots. If they're paying one way or the other, then maybe they're going to want to park in the lot, which takes up a space all day long. But if they're not paying to park a couple blocks away. So when I read the material, it was um, uh, about the, you know, the kiosks. Mm -hmm. it, it commented 15 minutes, you know, the first 15 mm -hmm. minutes don't, you know, you don't pay for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in other places where parking has been an issue where businesses are located. Um, pretty hard to implement, you know, an employee, in a, you know, a business stamping your card because it's not like that anymore. I mean, right. you're paying with your phone or something like that. You're not actually handing money to people or, right. or not. But um, is it unreasonable to think that maybe we could extend that free period so um, so if somebody's in for an appointment in mm -hmm. one of the businesses or somebody is mm -hmm. going into shop for an hour mm -hmm. um, I know that in other places where suddenly shops have sprouted um, I think of assembly, is it assembly square over in some mm -hmm. I know their garage. Mm -hmm. You go in and you put your credit card in and um, if you're out of there in two hours, um, it doesn't charge your credit card, it just opens the opens the gate and lets you out. I mean is Right, yeah. So with with parking meter parking kiosks, sorry, there are many different ways we can program them. You could program the first fifteen minutes free, you could program the first thirty minutes free. I would caution going too much beyond that. Um, for the simple reason that you know the one of the reasons to charge in lots is because the lots are really convenient and if you charge in them you know employees are less likely to pay to stay all day long so um, especially if they can get free parking you know a couple blocks away and and the you know the pay for parking helps turnover and and the utilization ratios and and it's frees up spaces for you know new people coming um, the other thing that you can do is you can program it to allow certain businesses to validate parking if they want to. You can. So yes, so there are many different <coughs> things you can do with the kiosks. One of the letters we got today, I th which I thought was actually, you know, a very sensible letter. Mm -hmm. I read the letter. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. there was some concern that you know somebody's going to come in for an appointment that's going to be a half hour or mm -hmm. forty-five minutes, and you don't want to drive them somewhere else. Right. Um, right. Where it's they don't have to pay, and so if we can, right? I mean, in my mind, if you're going to do the, the kiosk thing, you got to really think through yes. where you're putting it and who's there. Right, and I agree. And I, into that point, I will say that like putting kiosks in the public lots isn't a money-making grab. No, like, we're not no, doing this not for the money. Well. We're doing it to to help with the turnover and and help with the with getting different users in different locations so the system can function better and the and it's it's more of a management strategy um, than anything well, else. When I looked at the recommended thoughts about you know what it would cost we'd be lucky to break even on buying and maintaining the equipment I mean so it's it isn't about a revenue grab. Not necessarily no yeah. Right. So I know the board has a lot more questions but we have a lot of people in the audience as well that want to chime in so um, I was going to say, do you want to finish your presentation yeah. if the board can hold their questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to public comment. Yep. So I'm almost done. I just wanted to go through a couple more of like the key decisions that, um, you know, for implementation of the mm -hmm. system. So the first one is fee or no fee for the employee permit. The second one is, you know, should we formalize spaces on some of the side streets and that can be a, for a future conversation. Um, the time frame for on-street regulations. So if you're going to say public two hour, like what is what is that time frame? Um, you know, you could do a more limited time frame, like 10 to 4, which offers fle more flexibility on either end for, um, you know, like residents. So if they come home and they want to park um, their car along the street, like the regulations are no longer in place after 4 o'clock, or f I guess from 4 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, so, so as staff, we would recommend a more limited time frame for the regulations. Um, I could see it working um, if it's more broad, like eight to six as well. You know, it's just some uh, some different considerations, and you have to really like drill down and think about like who's using it and what that would mean. And and residents are the public as well, so that like 
you know, if you figure you could park there for two hours as a public person, you know, eight, the difference between eight and ten maybe doesn't make a huge. It's really like helps with limiting commuters from parking there and. Um, and like I said, we're not trying to be overly punitive and we're not trying to make money off of the system. So it, with that in mind, um, limiting the, um, the amount that the regulations are effective kind of seems in line with that. Um, let me see. Okay, so, so then additional implementation decisions um, regarding the kiosks. There's a couple different kiosk types, pay by plate or pay by space. Pay by plate is what we recommend. Um, you basically just punch in your license plate number when you get your permit and then you put your permit in your car. Um, or, or not, actually. Um, pay by space would require us to like actually stripe and number all the spaces. Um, the spaces are striped, but you know, adding numbers um, is maybe not recommended. And then again, with the lots, we'd want to look at the time frame for regulations and then also the time limits. So um, with the regulations, you start later in the morning and go from 10 to 6 or would they be all day um, I would make a plug for all day just because you know like I've said a couple times one of the goals here is to like not have people who want to park all day parking in the lot so <coughs> have a fee you know all day long like it's less likely that you're gonna get people par parking there all day long um, and then with regards to time limit I would argue saying no time limit in the lots but escalating the price after four hours um, so you know people could someone could stay for six hours if they need to run a ton of errands um, but you know escalating the price after four hours again is you know you might turn away someone who's an employee who's like gonna pay not gonna want to pay every single day and park in the lot every day um, and then the pricing strategy. Um, so what's been recommended by our consultant um, is having the first 15 minutes free. And then to, if you want to stay up to four hours, you could pay a dollar per hour. And then beyond that, again, it would escalate. So beyond four hours would be $2 an hour. So it's, it's a nominal amount if you're staying for a short time. But it's enough that you're, if you're an employee, you're probably not going to use one of those spaces all day, every day kind of walk in that line. But if and you're a commuter, it's $12 parking a day. Is that right? Right. That would be right. Sure. One of the things you mentioned is that there are some other communities around us that are, they've experimented already with these systems or have implemented them. Could we ask you to take a look and come back to us and investigate a little bit who's done it, how they've done it, how it's worked? Sure. Um, any feedback that they might offer to someone that's getting ready to do it themselves? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I have some before the board asks additional questions, I know I have some myself. Why don't we let finish let Julie finish up? We'll open it up to the public who has been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Um, and then the board can ask further questions or ask for feedback for a future meeting. I think this is the last slide. Um, so then again with kiosks and public lots, there are a few other things we need to consider. Um, one of them is, you know, as soon as we have a revenue stream from parking we want to set up a parking benefit district and that's basically just some legislation that allows us to have a fund outside of the general fund where revenues if we get any revenues from parking go into that fund and then we can use them and dedicate them right back into the downtown area so they can be used the money can be used for like almost anything related to the downtown area where the money is ge being generated so um, it would directly go back to helping improve the, the downtown and you know, <coughs> that that downtown business environment um, we would also want to invest in license plate recognition technology for enforcement um, and then make sure we're using mobile apps that will work with the kiosks that are similar to mobile apps that are used in nearby towns so that people don't have to have a ton of different parking apps on their phone to, if they want to park um, in Reading or if they want to park in Arlington or Wakefield or wherever. Um, so these are things that are also discussed in the memo from the consultant. And I think that's all. Oh, just our request for you tonight, which solicit public input. All right, so that's where we are. Uh, Vanessa, yep. I, I just need an uh, understanding of what we're actually deciding. Are we being offered two options, two, two hours parking limit in that inner core, or two hours but with Kia? <coughs> is, that, is that? I'll go back to that map. Um, it's a little bit of both to answer your question. Um, 
No, but I mean. Okay, so within this inner core area here, mm -hmm. um, the on street spaces would be public to our, and then the lot, the spaces in the public lots would be, you know, whatever you decide, mm -hmm. um, but kiosks, and you could allow uh, no time limit, so all day long, mm -hmm. um, and then you'd price it accordingly. Got it. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right. Um, so again, let's ask the board to hold questions until the end. Uh, I know it's warm in here. Can we open, if anyone's sitting up, such open these windows just a crack to let in some air? I know it's toasty. <coughs> all right. So, um, there's a lot of people in the room. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's tough to come out for nighttime meetings, but we really do appreciate your input, both from the residents and the business owners in town. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, what I'll ask is if you can raise your hand. Please introduce yourself. Give your name and address if you're a resident, or your name and your business if you are a local business owner. Um, like I said, there are a lot of people, so if you keep your question or comment brief, it would be appreciated so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, with that, I'll open it up to public comment. Okay. Um, put the gentleman right here in the blue and green. Okay. Um, I'm Brian Knight. I live at 100 Lincoln Street. Um, you had mentioned uh, expanding um, parking up Lincoln Street, but if people know going from downtown to to the train station. Parking goes from both sides of the street to just one side because the street narrows. Um, are we going to do parking on both sides of the street as you get to the train station, or is it still going to just be on the north side of the street? So we would only, um, so we would keep the spaces that are currently striped. Um, we may or may not stripe additional spaces, but when we when when engineering looked at the inventory, they looked at um, what's feasible given you know where the um, curb cuts are, and then also what's feasible given the road widths and ensuring that a fire truck would still be able to get by. So I know it does get a little narrow and tight as you get closer to the train, and so I mean that that stretch of Woburn probably wouldn't be an area we would add spaces to but so they looked at the whole length from high street all the way to lowell street and in that whole length um do i have that on here yeah um it looks like the consultant thought maybe 84 spaces but engineering thought maybe we could get 50. and so some of them are there already and then some would be added and and another key um answer to that or component of that is that the spaces might already be there we and in, in that location we might be more changing the regulations than like increasing the actual supply the, the difference between the 81 and 50 makes more sense then. yeah okay. okay other questions yes john in the back hi uh, nick Caston, ready pediatric associates um we're at 52 haven uh, and and use the uh, brain court never knew it was called that. um <laughs> We have about 20, 21 uh, employees and uh, have about usually 12 to 13 employees there at a time um, on a weekly basis uh, and see on average probably 40 patients a day in our office. Um, each visit, you know, family's probably there an hour. Uh, sometimes they're there for two hours if they're there with more than one uh, child. Um, Sometimes two parents come from different business or in different offices, so they often use more than one spot. Um, rarely they're more than two hours, so the two hour parking that's free currently is working quite well for us. I understand the employee parking issue is certainly an issue. I'm afraid that using the uh, kiosk plan for, you know, no charge or a certain charge, one charge for like all day would be even more of a problem allowing more commuters to use that those spots and not allowing them for the use for our patients who often have uh, strollers, carriages, um, and such, and mothers carrying multiple, uh, often multiple babies in, in uh, car seats down into our office. Uh, wouldn't want them to have to walk down from Woodward Street down that very steep uh, street that has no um, sidewalk, you know, and can be very icy in the winter to get into our office. Um, and like I said, we have, we have large, uh, employee staff that uh, many of whom are there till after well after dark um, and I you know I'm not sure I want people walking up that that uh, you know street that has no again no sidewalk uh, in the middle of winter when it can be very icy at times too so that, those are my 
I guess 10 o'clock, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a clarification? Of course. Which is the street with no sidewalk, sorry. Um, it's the one that comes down from Bancroft. It's the entrance to the park. It's the right? drive entrance. Right, yeah. Well, on the Wolverine, but right, it's across from Bancroft. Yeah. No, not from Bancroft. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's, it's, it's okay. Like okay. It's the one yeah. way that comes down. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. And it is steep, but it's yeah, very steep. icy in the winter time. Yeah. Because that's another thing that we would need to take into consideration is like whether we would need to make safety improvements, um, especially if we're you know promoting like employee parking in the one or two blocks off of the right off of the downtown, like where we might want to add lighting or sidewalks or and the parking benefit district. Any funding we get could actually directly go back into um, stuff like that. So, thank you. More questions? Yes, gentlemen here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Quintel. I live on 64 Wooden Street, which is between Main and the depot. And uh, we have uh, employee parking in front of our house, which I don't mind at all. But they crowd the driveway. And I wonder if there's something that we can do to put some type of regulation. We've had the police come out to look at it, and they said they can't do anything. There's no regulations. For that so of course if you strike then that would solve that problem but otherwise if there was a way to just leave a couple of feet on either side mm -hmm. particularly if we're going to allow people to park on the other side of the street um, we probably all do it it's a very busy street people tend to speed through there it's dangerous pulling in and out mm -hmm. great thank you very much yeah. thank you. julie do we have any stipulation for how close people can park two driveways right yeah. If they block a driveway, though, they can't, I mean... Well, they, you can't get out, we obviously have to control the car, but there is no general laws on how close you can be to a driveway. On narrow streets, I know it can be a problem because if you park too close and there's snow, there's, <coughs> there's, no, there's no angle at which you can get out of your driveway. Well, so. yeah, I mean, there's that because you can, <coughs> when you come out, if there's a car across the street exactly. from you or yeah. a snow or yeah. a snowplow, but... If somebody's blocking your driveway, that so sounds like it's got to be towed. No, they're not. They're not blocking. Absolutely not blocking. They're just pulling the bumper of their car right up right to the there. edge of the driveway. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. now you've got to pull out into Wooden Street with traffic going back and forth very quickly, mm -hmm. and it's dangerous. Yeah. That's all. Okay. So if we could just make a buffer zone there of some sort, I know that uh, other towns do this, mm -hmm. where they say you yeah, can't park within three feet of the driveway on either side or something. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Other comments, questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Don Warren. I live at Temple Street. And you had mentioned that it would be two hour parking in front of my home. Um, would a resident sticker override that? Um, so you live at 10 Gold Street, but not 9 or 11 Gold Street? No, they're across the street. Okay. Um, so the, the regulations in that location would change. So not for 9 and 11 Gold Street, but right. for your side of the street, um, such that the, the idea there would be that it would be public two hour um, and, and not res no longer would be resident only. So I couldn't park in front of my home. As a public person, you could park for two hours, but uh, and then if we if the, the regulations are from ten to four, you would be able to park you know any time before ten, actually up to twelve for two hours, and then any time from two o'clock on. So that would be why that's one of the reasons why I would want to limit that time frame, right? Because it gives residents more flexibility, but it also doesn't allow them to park four hour all day long. That you can. Yeah. No. Right. Thank you. So, other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Manuel German. I live on 12 in the street, and I have it basically the same problem she's going to have. If you make it uh, two hours, that means that I can park there because I can only be there for two hours. My problem is that we have a three multiple cars, uh, and the house is a two-family house, and that will mean that we'll have to do a lot of juggling um, one people will be in front of the other and now I gotta call, move your car, I mean behind you or they'll call me and do the same thing and that, that, that will be for us a very problematic, not mentioning 
all the things for cats. Where I live, I have the light post here, which one time when the light department was installing the new transformer that is there now, there wasn't. I, I dare to ask them, would you please move you, would you move the light post to feed so I can get in and out on my driving better? And the answer was, why don't you move the house? But that's besides the point. That's besides the point. My problem is that I have a long driveway. I can fit three cars, but like I said, then I have a stone wall on the Italian street, and uh, I cannot, even, you know, that will, uh, uh, by now, it, no problem. Somebody parks in front, because we, are, we have the resident uh, sticker, and there's no problem. But if this comes up, to be an effect, it's gonna, I'm probably gonna think about moving. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. More questions, comments? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is it's my husband, Manuel. I'm Karen German. I'm a lifelong resident of Reading. Same house, same street. We're into our third generation now with our little grand uh, granddaughter who was born three years ago. This two hour parking thing, seen it all, folks. For all my life, all this parking, 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 two hours, this, that, and the other thing. They even wanted to switch Linden Street from the direction it's going in now, so the traffic came from Lowell Street all the way down to Haven Street, which would have been a nightmare. I'm glad that was stopped. Um, but anyway, as far as right now, there are no problems on Linden Street. There, the part we abut, our property abuts the parking lot behind the Oak Street, the Oak Tree development. Don't see any issues there. There's a lot of people who park there, yes. We also have people parking on Linden Street, but no problems. We have people parking there all day. I assume they work in the area. I don't care. Um, when we're done our shopping or traveling for the day, we park in the driveway, summer, winter, anytime. We also, have been aware of the funeral home across the street all my life. When they have a funeral, we're off the street so they can have the street for their customers, clients, whatever. There are a lot of issues that people who do these studies aren't aware of. If you want to do two-hour parking by the Masonic Temple on Linden Street, that area, that's fine. We don't have any issues with that area. But from Grant Court, up to the corner of uh, Woburn Street. There is no parking from the telephone central, the Verizon building, to the corner for a good reason. Because the cars, the trucks, can't get in and out of their driveway. We had an issue years ago with people from the Atlantic uh, supermarket parking there. And one day I heard this clang, and the truck was going into the driveway of Verizon. And somebody from the Atlantic had parked right up to the edge of the driveway and lost their bumper. And we've had accidents at the corner of Linden Street because when people are parked on both sides of Woburn Street, as Tom was talking about, they can't see. When you're standing on the corner of uh, Woburn Street and Linden Street, there's a dip in Woburn Street. They come up from the depot, then they go in like this, and then all of a sudden they appear if there are cars parked there. So if you're pulling out from Linden Street, it's like, ah, what happened? You, know, I didn't even, you didn't even see them. So there's issue, the reasons why. The other issue is those of us who live on the even side of the street can't get out of our driveways when people are parked on the other side. There's just no room. So that's why we have the 10, the, the parking restriction in the morning. Works like a charm. After that, anybody can park on the street anywhere, anytime, as long as they don't block our driveways. So for now, as far as I can see, there's no need for two-hour parking unless you want to do it at the very end of Linden Street. I think they've done that before. Works very well for the people who own the businesses and whatever there. Um, I suspect the people who are parking all day are business owners. They have their sticker and everything, so it's all proper. But I would say, please leave Linden Street alone. Everything is fine right now. And that's a lifelong, <laughs> lifetime experience I'm, I'm going on. We're just fine right now. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. Um, so let's grab these six tweets are up. Um, I would just ask that the board, um, in considering all these many variables, also consider um, how these plans might intersect with any future um, efforts to install uh, electric vehicle charging stations around town or um, put in um, striping for uh, bike transit through uh, say Hoover Street or Oak Haven or any of the other places where parking might expand. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes. I'm Nicole Harrington. I'm a pediatric dentist at PDA Dental Group and we're actually across this, the hallway from Dr. Nick. And I just wanted to echo exactly the same concerns that he stated we have with concern for our, our pediatric families. Um, I did have a question with regard to his comment about commuters using the lot if there was a metered situation. I believe you said it was twelve dollars for a full day. Is that correct? If it if it was if metered? the recommended pricing scheme is um, supported and adopted, then that would be correct to park there. Do you know what the comparable price would be? For instance, like I know now there's all those leased spots, and I'm assuming many people pay to then commute. Mm -hmm. Do you know the price comparison? I'm just wondering if that would be a bargain for people to park to get the, um. the twelve dollar. I think actually the lease spaces are a bargain. Okay. Uh, compar comparatively speaking. I think twelve dollars a day would be twice what they're paying. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The MBK lot of six. And the same thing with the resident sticker. I mean, you know, when you that's park a across yeah. the. That's a good question. I mean, that you know, if you think about it every day, the resident sticker that you buy, what do we get for that? One fifty. One fifty. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's. Substantial. That's the bargain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be the most expensive place you could. Sure. You could pay to park. Right. On purpose. And then the only other question I had was, um, if I know your study is obviously <coughs> covers a particular area in town, but our concern is obviously just our particular lot. So I was wondering if the time limit that we currently have, if you found that the spot utilization was problematic currently, and that's why you're looking within that particular lot, why you're looking to make such a large change for its meter. Oh, yeah, so that's, there's, that's like a two-part question. So the study was done actually before the time changed to four hours in that, in the Brandy Court lot. Um, is, is that the time restriction you're talking about, yes. the four hours? Currently we have the four hours, so, and we don't get complaints. I know, I don't know if you do in your office, but, our front desk has notified me that the, the patients haven't been complaining about having an issue finding a spot. So I was just curious that you had seen otherwise with your data. Um, so, so you're saying that you, at PDA Dental, you're not hearing complaints from patients about finding a spot? Correct. Okay. Um, that's good to know. So, so basically the study that was done was done back when the lot was still two hours and at that time we had a lot of feedback that two hours wasn't long enough and that we needed, since this on-street parking was also two hours, that we needed some areas where people could stay longer. Um, since then we're hearing that because we've expanded it to four hours and we're offering it for free, there are, there are actually a lot of employees that are using the four hour spaces um, and then you know maybe moving their car for the latter half of the day or um, we're kind of like giving away kind of half day parking for free and the the utilization studies that were done before when the lot was two hours like showed that you know overall our public utilization so like like on street and off street public spaces utilization overall is very low like less than 40 percent across span of a whole day but when you parse that out into on street spaces versus the off street the lots were actually pretty highly utilized and and in high utilized areas you can justify putting in parking kiosks to kind of help with the turnover of the supply and to make spaces more available for patrons of businesses um, and in this case you know a patron of, of PDA dental if they needed to stay for one hour they could pay for one hour if they needed two they could pay for two you know if the space if the spaces continue to be available throughout the day then patrons will, will have the ability to choose how long they want to stay um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I just, I, I am kind of still 
it, if, it, if it doesn't seem to be problematic, I'm curious why, if this is also going to be such a large investment for the town, from what it sounds like, to institute the meters. I understand the concept of turnover and flow certainly makes sense, but with the actual data that you've seen and just a feedback from the businesses, if it hasn't been problematic for our clients, um, just curious why take that next step to fund right right that. so that's a, that's a really good question we had we had talked at one point about just putting kiosks in the CVS lot to start with and then I believe it was suggested that we treat the lots the same way and I don't remember if that suggestion came from the select board um, or from the consultant um, maybe both actually but there was some thinking about having our public lots be treated in a similar fashion um, to be consistent um, because one of the things I mentioned earlier on in the presentation is that we have so many different regulations downtown um, and one of the goals of this system-wide overhaul would be to like really make it simpler for the user so it's it's less frustrating and people can get used to it and you know know what to expect um, but that's a good good question that you bring up thank you um, Aaron? Um, I'm the economic development director with the town and also business liaison. Um, I also wanted to add to Julie's comment um, that we did hear from a number of businesses as well that four hours is not working because there's not enough turnover for those businesses who have um, customers coming in for maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes or maybe an hour. Um, and so one of the advantages of having a parking kiosk system is allowing for multiple users to have their own choices about how long there and at the very end of the day we want to just incentivize employees from parking in front of the front doors. <coughs> we hope that with this parking kiosk system we're providing many, many, many variations of opportunities for a wide variety of users for a wide variety of different times um, to meet parking demands for all of the different kinds of businesses in town. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Mary. Yes. Hi, I'm um, Jennifer Driscoll from Ready Foot and Ankle, and I think you all got a letter um, from Dr. Baudier. She couldn't be here, but I'd like to echo the other two businesses there that our customers that come in are not having trouble parking today, and putting a kiosk system for our patients in particular, I'd say 65% are elderly, they're on fixed income, they come five times a year, they don't stay more than a half hour or 45 minutes. I don't even know if they'd have a smartphone to use a kiosk. Mm -hmm. It would be, I mean, just the thought process of we have 90 year old patients every day. Population is getting older. They come up with the ride. Um, it would be a real problem for our practice to have them using kiosks unless we could validate an hour or more for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a big investment for the town as well. Thank you. Yeah. So the, I believe kiosks can, you know, work with different types of media and wouldn't necessarily have to be a smartphone. Um, and that would be something that, you know, we definitely, if we did choose a kiosk, we would want to make sure that people could use, could pay in different ways. Um, it's absolutely essential, in my opinion, um, to make sure that access is, you know, fair. Um, and we did talk earlier about the idea of, val of allowing businesses to validate too, which I think is a really good idea. Um, Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Yes. Um, Christine Lusk, I just have a question. If you have to pay to park in a lot for the kiosk, but the street parking is free, won't that disincentivize people from parking the lots? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. So the, the thinking there is um, if people you know, want to stay longer than two hours, <coughs> okay, in the lot, because the on-street parking would be, you know, two hours, and so, you know, if you have a quick errand and you can find an on-street space, that, that's great, you wouldn't have to pay at all, um, but if you wanted to stay longer, you could, and you could park in the lot. Thank you. More no questions? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Lisa Egan, I'm an aide over at Children in Reading, and I'm also the chamber director in Reading, and I just want to say I really appreciate um, the thoughtfulness that's gone into this planning and I also appreciate the fact that you guys are open to the comments and everyone coming tonight because I think it's really important and in living and working downtown I know that talking to different people it's very anecdotal and everyone has their own preferences 
I also am a little concerned about um, just we have such a great there's so many uh, shopping areas near Reading and I know a lot of our businesses are for running very lean. When I think about Reading, I know a lot of people <coughs> go to Woburn or nearby Linfield or, or Burlington. And I also collaborate and obviously live and work right near, you know, Linfield and Stoneham, Woburn and um, North Reading. And to the best of my knowledge, not one of those neighboring communities or the bigger cities near us that I know we see a lot of leakage from, which is the term that the MAPC used when they studied the economic habits of, and spending in Reading, that a lot of the people who live in Reading actually spend a lot of their dollars in Linfield and Burlington because of the great you know, shopping choices. Um, and I did a little online research. I don't think any of those communities have metered parking. So while I think it's definitely worth considering and talking about further, I'm concerned that it's not gonna be a level playing field um, and I've also sat through many economic development meetings that have talked about the importance of a vibrant downtown and the importance of downtown in general and how we're so fortunate that we have, you know, walkability and pedestrian safety. <coughs> we've improved it dramatically in 10 years. So I just worry that in talking to business owners frequently that it's going to be another reason to not shop in Reading. And I don't mean to be negative. I think that there's a lot of good ideas and I want to continue them. I'm happy to hear that you aren't planning on voting this evening. Um, I would like to um, offer to host a meeting where business owners and residents, if they'd like to come, but can speak informally, perhaps at a time before business hours, for an hour from 8.30 to 9.30, where people can talk about solutions um, and what might work well for their business to help um, strengthen our working relationship, not only with the board, but between uh, communication with, with different businesses. And the example <coughs> I like to use is that my office is on Pleasant Street, and I love the fact that I can park all day in front of my office. But I'm sure Reading Square Barber does not love the fact that I'm parked in front of her door front all day. So it just goes to show two businesses working side by side in the same building have totally different priorities. So I think, you know, maybe a smaller <coughs> meeting that's not broadcast on television might be a good next step that we're happy to host if the board is interested. Um, I think it would be just a great way to just talk further about this in light of the fact that while we knew this was coming, um, you know, it's getting later and there's a lot of different stakeholders um, that all have a lot to, you know, a lot to share and learn about this whole experience. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I can't speak for the board. I'd be more than happy and, and I imagine the two of you being the Econ Develop Development Committee members. Um, would be more than happy to meet with a subgroup of business owners in the area um, so we can hear more about what their thoughts are. It's and not just on this, with, but more broad. And we could do it without cameras, but it would still have to be an open meeting posted sure. if, if we have a if quorum. We, if board. we have a quorum. Yeah. Of course. And if yeah. you want to take it, that's fine. I, just, <laughs> no. I understand. I understand the, the value. You yeah. know, empathy <laughs> with what, yes. what I really want is not yeah. what the person down the street really wants. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. when the final solution is reached, we all can kind of understand and fill up where, where we've all had a chance to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say, and I meant to say, I applaud the fact that, that so many individual interviews were done downtown. But again, there's no silver bullet or perfect solution. It's really about trying to figure out what works pretty good for most is the, the, what we can strive for. Thanks, Lisa. Other public comment? Yes, gentleman in the back. Uh, Oh, sorry, yeah. I had a couple of other questions. Sure. Um, Tom Quinto, 64 Wilmer Street. Is there consideration for additional enforcement when we deploy kiosks, if we deploy kiosks? Um, so I could partly answer that and maybe the police department could chime in too. So enforcement becomes easier actually with the kiosks because they're automated and, and they're based on license plate recognition technology and there's all sorts of like, you know, I don't, things I don't know about that go on behind the scenes in those little boxes. Um, but I, we, you know, it has been suggested by our parking consultant that at least when we roll this out, if we roll this out, that we, you know, go a little easier <coughs> enforcement at first as people are getting used to it and, uh, and adjusting to it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or what you're... Yeah, it just seems to me that with the changes in regulations plus with the kiosks mm -hmm. so that with, uh, I'm not sure if we have part-time uh, enforcement at this point, but it feels light-handed to me. And it seems as though we could use additional enforcement 
so that all of the good thinking that has gone into this plan now is is actually executed. You haven't met our parking enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> It's, we actually make, with all the different regulations, we get some part-time for us that's also our animal control officer. The officer is also enforced, but to be honest with you, cost of service has significantly risen. So we're responding to cost of service. We're, we're trying to get downtown and enforce when we can. The parking enforcement also made it clear, especially with all the projects going on, this is a priority. Um, but it is one of those things that would make it easier enforcement-wise for us. If it's automated, he can drive by, he's not looking at an individual car, taking notes of what car is there, how long it's been there, it'll actually speed up and make enforcement easier for us and quicker for us um, with the, the changes that are made. Especially if the regulations are more consistent and not 15 in one area, it'll make it easier for enforcement-wise for us. But adding 500 spaces that require an employee program? But if it's one area that is all employee, if it's one area it's all two hour, when he's driving down the street, it's easy to look at as compared to it's two hours, all the other employee, or it's okay with a permit. He's looking for three or four different things on every single car. It would make it the enforcement easier for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Yes. Hi, uh, Peter Sims, Sims Jewelers up in the square. Uh, I didn't understand truly until tonight why the last six months we've had a log jam uptown in our parking. I thought it was only, mostly because of the four hour parking lot. But I didn't know till tonight that the old two-hour parking limit for the day had been lifted. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of the employees don't know that as of yet. Uh, just to give this group a little history, 20 some odd years ago we did an extensive study and that's when these, these old parking regulations were put in. I'm not saying we don't have to change them, but we do. The reason why we put two uh, I'm sorry, two-hour all-day parking in was our biggest problem was the employees. The employees were parking out in the lot. Every two hours they would run out, they would move their cars to the next spot. Every two hours they would move them to the next spot. Downtown, I have had not had so many complaints in the, probably the last 20 years as I've gotten in the last six months from customers. I've driven around three times, four times, I can't find a place to park. Yep. Um, so I came into this meeting tonight not in favor of kiosks at all, but if we're not going to go back to a two-hour parking limit. It's going to be awful. The employees are just going to, and, and once word of this spreads, I'm sure down in, in the, 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 the Haven Street lot, it's going to be the same thing. The employees are going to all stop. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. It happened 20 years ago, and it's going to happen again. Um, I also have just a couple other questions. Uh, by the way, I think Lisa's completely correct. I think a, a group of people working with the town planners here would be a lot more effective in an open meeting and a free talk would get a lot more accomplished and bring it to the board than having to speak here like this. Um, I believe you guys just wiped out 10 spots at the senior center that were all day parking. It's very, you took the quote earlier. Those spots were put in 20 some odd years ago. Um, when three spots were taken, where the savings bank is, the savings bank donated $50,000 to the town to take down the old police station under the agreement, not written in stone, that there would be 10 spaces there for all-day parking in the senior center lot for all-day parkers so that we put some of our employees over there. Apparently it's been underutilized, maybe people didn't know they were there. Uh, I would ask you to go back and take a look at those 10 spaces you wiped out. Also, I took a ride by Walgreens today. Spaces that used to be all day parking for employees, I know I used to rent one there, is now two hour parking. I don't know when that was changed. So a lot of spaces have been moved around. It used to be all day uh, parking that was available for um, um, people that worked in the buildings. Um, and that really needs to be looked at. I mean, a lot of these spots, you know, we were promised 10 spots at the police station 30 years ago. We never got them. So, I mean, you know, we've lost spots all over the place. We really have to address this. And I really think meeting with the, the, the planner would be would be great for all these people to be able to talk. I've been in the lobby tonight just out in the hallway talking to people that I didn't know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now a couple comments. Yes, okay. Um, so I know that uh, it's 10 o'clock now. Um, I know I have numerous questions and, and comments, um, but I'll open it up to the board based off of what we heard tonight and the presentation. Andy? Yeah, I, I have a, a couple. Um, 
the, first of all, the Linden Street resident, um, it, it seems that, at least at the map you presented, Julie, uh, uh, for Linden Street, that that would be uh, permit only from 6 to 10.30. It's not a two. It's not a. Uh, it's not going to be opened up for a two-hour parking until after 10:30. Is that right? Um, Am I reading the map right? So you're close. Um, you know, if you agree to public two-hour here on Linden, um, and you agree to restrict the time frame from 10 to 4, then it would be, you know, public two-hour between 10 and 4. Um, so it could be, you know, residents would still be able to park there from <coughs> 6 in the morning until actually 12. Um, uh -huh. And they could get there before anyone else since they live right there. I mean, if that's, you know, so they, they would be restricted, as John pointed out, really just like four hours, four hours right in the middle of the day. Sure. Right, yeah. right. Because the way I'm reading it, uh, the, the stretch from Woburn Street to Haven Street, is that what we're talking about? Yes, right here. Right. So currently, it's resident. It's resident only from six to ten thirty in the morning. Yeah. The orange highlight would indicate that um, it would be changed to public two hour. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I, I so see. there's the two, I see. there's the big so you've overlaid regulations, which are the like really solid lines, and then there's the highlights, which is what's proposed. Of what's proposed. I I see. I understand that. Um, and, and the other question I had is for residents who, how many spots are we talking about if, if for residents that live in downtown North? Um, so I think it's a total, in, the, in downtown North, um, the total number of spots is about like 875. It, so include the inner core plus the outer core. Right. I, I'm sorry. I should have been more specific. For the people who live in the downtown, mm -hmm. okay. if we wanted to accommodate them and have a, some special permit that was only for mm -hmm. uh, resident downtown north parking, um, how many spaces would, would be taken up by that? Um, so let me just, so it's all these areas that are like highlighted in, that are, sorry, that are magenta, are, yeah. they, are resident only? Is that what yeah. you're asking, like what the total is that we're, that we're proposing to change? Yeah, it seems um, like a lot, right? Yeah, it's so few, I think it's a few hundred. It's, um, a couple hundred. I can do this quickly, hold on. It's, you also include east of Main Street. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, if if it was uh, a low number, we could we could we could accommodate those residents with some sort of special uh, permit. But that would, looking at the extent of it now, that would sort of ruin the plan. You have hundreds of residents. Yeah. There. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. could really just kind of defeat the whole idea. Of what yeah. No, I I see. And I think yeah, I think part of the issue there is it's not like. So it's any resident in town really can buy a resident community access permit and come and park in these resident only areas. And so like there's, you know, our utilization data indicates that that's probably a decent number of commuters who are doing that. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily like these people who live right in the inner core with this property frontage restriction are benefiting. Right. The, the idea I had, which I don't think would work, would be, would be actually not just a, a, a resident permit sticker for the people who live in this area, but a you know a special sticker that identifies them as uh, owning property. Like a downtown resident. Like yeah. yeah, downtown resident. But I I mean I think I definitely think you know getting more information about like who gets them and how they're used would be helpful and do they need them like you know I mean especially if like you limit the time frame when the regulations apply like right. If there's a way to kind of meet in the middle on that, yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, my only concern is these people have invested in their, have, have, you know, their. Right. That's most people's nest egg, at least is mine. Mm -hmm. So, um, if if you take away their ability to park their cars uh, effectively, mm -hmm. um, that's going to lower their property value, and, and if we could 
protect against that in some fashion without ruining the ruining your proposal because I understand it's very important that we create parking for customers downtown um, and focus on customers but we also have to consider the residents I, it's a, yeah John you had a comment I, so I just had a question really truly for you sure. have you considered or would you consider in the solutions that you've put in front of us mm -hmm. um, you know we've heard anecdotally and I know this to be true um, in the CVS parking lot you know we've gotten letters about it and just from a practical reality of being in town all day the circling that's going on right now is stunning um, and I, I know Peter that you're right about that I'm not surprised you've got customers saying that to you but so it makes me wonder if you know the jump would be okay you got four-hour parking let's jump to kiosks and I'm wondering if you know maybe we just ratchet that back in both of these parking lots to two-hour parking as a first step and then see how it goes mm -hmm. let's because then it starts to become anecdotal we've got to hear from the businesses and we will hear from we will hear from citizens who are trying to shop there you know whether that's working for them um, and I think that if I think the four-hour thing is you know is an extreme that could be causing problems in both of those lots and so we've come up with a solution of a kiosk which it would have the effect of solving that problem but I'm wondering if there's a step in the middle because Right. Honestly speaking, even though I know that there are certain places not far from us that have kiosk parking or parking meters, um, I, I think our, I think first of all the businesses that we have, and in the areas we're talking about, soon there's going to be another half a dozen businesses at least, and you know, between the project at Snoco and the mm -hmm. and you know the project at Emark and the project at the post office. Each one of those is going to have another three businesses. So it makes me wonder if there's not a kind of a two-step process here. Yeah. Let's try. I mean, that would be my inclination to say let's try. Let's go back to two-hour parking. You know, in um, in in Brandy and in CVS, and let's see what happens. Let's see what we hear from the businesses. I think Lisa's idea is a great one. They have a kind of an ongoing, regular dialogue. So. Thanks, John. Mark? So, um, first of all, I think this is fantastic in terms of understanding what's going on, getting the input, and being able to discuss it. At the end of the day, we have to figure out how to maximize parking while, while minimizing inconvenience. That's going to be the balancing act that we've got to figure out. And, and to John's point, we used to be at two hours, and some folks had suggested to us they needed four, so we jumped to four. Now we're we're reaping the unintended concerns. consequences. Exactly, exactly. Now we're reaping the. We, we were that. warned about some potential unintended consequences. Yeah, and and so they're getting to play out. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think we. I love the idea of doing more forms, understanding a little bit more. I think we just want to be careful. Um, exceptions here there and all over the place I think we won't get done what we wanted to get done so I think we got to kind of figure out what is what's an option that kind of seems to be the best maybe sit back and think about it a little bit um, I'd love to walk some of these areas too just to kind of get a, a real flavor I don't know if the board members would be interested we don't walk here some of us do <laughs> <laughs> but get a flavor of what's going on so can, I just, can I offer a quick comment so um when we used to have two hours in the lots we would hear that there was nowhere to park if you needed to stay longer right. um and you know i do think it like i hear what you're saying <coughs> um, i maybe there's another middle step that that could be taken i just need to think about it a little more but i'm not sure that going back to two hour and then also having public two hour on the street like all the parking will then be the same so i'm not sure it's going to help with like sorting and utilization and having users kind of self-select areas to, to be, I think we might kind of just go back to the problems that we've been hearing about. I've mean, been here four years, so, you know, yeah. three and a half yeah. of the four years I've worked here. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Shirley. Um, all right, so we're going to go Bob, Dr. Nick, the lieutenant, and over here to yeah. there, and, and then we'll get Anne. 
right. Go with Dr. Oh, Bob first. Uh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, right then. Cool. I've, I've heard this discussion in this room for 14 years, so not quite as long as Peter Sims has. One of the challenges the board has is certain businesses have certain appetites for different patterns of parking, and businesses change. Is parking always going to change depending on who the business is in that spot? That's a philosophical question that past boards have struggled with. Um, and the other is, um, the perfect example, uh, Gene and I sat down with um, an even number of business owners several years ago, and there was unanimous agreement that the parking situation was terrible. And when we asked the question, do you need more than two hours or less than two hours, exactly half said one and exactly half said the other. And so we gave them a simple assignment. You go off and figure it out when you come back and tell us, and we never saw them again. So different businesses, by their nature, have different types of clients. Some make appointments. Some are impulse buyers for retail, if you will. And you have to try to come up with, most importantly, I think, a simple system that's understandable by all. And no one is going to have a perfect solution for the businesses. But these are some of the th things the board just needs to take 17 steps back and really think about this as a concept. Yeah. Because you're going to be back here time and time again, otherwise. Okay. All right. Dr. Matt? Yeah, I guess my only question, you know, that, that dialing it back to the two-hour parking is great for our patients. Um, now more problematic for the employees, however, because now we have five permits, uh, whereas we used to have 12 or 13 <laughs> permits. Um, so unless, you know, if the other zoning does get changed on Woburn and, and the outer area that's fine but if it doesn't then you know and it just gets dialed back to two hours that's a big problem for our employees too so i think you know pda would have the same, same yeah. Yeah. Okay. thank you uh lieutenant um, that's pretty much what i was going to say so the whole drive and force is really why i we started this whole downtown park here is the amount of emails and concerns that you know just got to get about employee parking I mean, we all know it's hard to drive around here to get a spot for as a customer but the employee parking is really what started this entire thing. So I think if we did go back to two hour, I'd be really afraid about the employee. <coughs> so again, if we're not enforcing this two hour spot thing, because it's not actually written in there, um, I'd be really afraid of the employees. And that was my um, favoritism of the kiosk is to keep the employees out of those two lots. So that's Thank you. Um, Aaron, and then we'll go over to Ann. I'd like to offer that the kiosks actually provide a lot of really helpful data um, over time as well. Uh, the kiosks provide help with enforcement, help with turnover, and help with data collection. So we'll know how many people are parking for what periods of time over time and be able to see trends over time. And that's really important data for us from an economic development perspective um, to see you know, how long people are spending in town. Um, as different businesses come and go. Um, and that's data that we don't have access to right now in an easy and accessible way. Um, so I think that having parking kiosks in the parking lots, which we know to be high utilization areas, will really help us in the long run and also be adaptable to all the wide ranges of users and time frames and the kiosks are adjustable with technology as well. So if we needed to or wanted to say first two hours or three or whatever the case may be, it's not recommended um, at that two hour mark for a wide variety of reasons. But we are flex those that system is flexible and I think will have the impact of being able to turn over spaces. And don't forget that we are offering free parking spaces on street. Um, so that's something to think about. The parking um, lots were specifically targeted because we're really high, high, high utilization. We're not experiencing turnover. And that's really important. Thank you, Anne. So it's, it's interesting that my comment is following yours, Erin, because I was, I've was i been thinking about the um, the data collection by the use of kiosks and, and from, a, from a privacy perspective and actually um, having concerns about what kind of data would be collected if we were if we did go with a kiosk approach and a license plate approach because then we could be tracking where people are when and you know not everyone will want to know that want the town to have access to the information that they are you know regularly parking in front of their doctor's office and that they're you know seeking those kind of medical appointments for example um, 
you know, that, that there's actually like a systemized way of tracking that. Not that I think, you know, Aaron Schaefer is concerned <laughs> that I am going to the pediatric and the dentist uh, with, with my children on X days. But, you know, there's, I think, some privacy concerns around the around use of data. So I actually was more, if we were to go with a kiosk approach, I think there, there's some appeal from a private privacy perspective to going to the, the numbered spaces as opposed to um, license plates which could actually track people's individual movements. Um, so. okay. yes. Oh, um, I was just, my customers have actually been thrilled with the four-row parking behind CVS, so I just want to make sure you do hear that. Others, you know, exactly as you heard, half like it, half don't. Um, so if we just went back to the two-hour, I would be sad for my customers. Um, I think what has been offered in terms of ex increased employee parking is really half the battle. Like, it is the employee problem. It's getting, like, I know my own employees, uh, you know, sometimes abused a lot. I try to keep them out of there, but I'm not their mother. Um, so having more options, and particularly if we do have the offer of the, the free permits, that's actually a huge incentive to, like, here's the thing that you can put in your car, please go park over there. And really those spaces are not so far. I mean, and you've all heard me say this a thousand times, like, if people spent half the energy walking from a slightly farther parking space that they, they spend complaining about parking, we actually have, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it, we have plenty of parking. And yes, sometimes you have to circle the block a couple of times. Park a block away and walk, for God's sakes. But anyway, that aside, <laughs> I appreciate the incredible amount of work that's gone into this already. Um, while I absolutely appreciate Lisa's concerns about, oh, suddenly we're going to have a paid parking situation where in neighboring towns we don't, I, I would be willing to roll the dice on that just to get that movement in lots of sounds. And, and believe me, I'm in a no margin business, so I, I'm all well aware of like the risks there. Um, but it seems like a great way to get employees out of those lots, get people into those other spaces, and get, get people moving around. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Um, I think there's a public comment question here, and then Andy. Great. Just my question about the kiosk. So in our lot behind Haven, is it just one big kiosk that you have to then walk with your car to then pay and then walk back to the... So I'm just thinking about the yeah, our dental <laughs> office, your office, the pediatrician, and also the foot and ankle doctors as well. Um, so. I, I believe our consultant is recommending actually two kiosks in each lot that would be at strategic locations close to walking paths. Um, and I think with pay by plate, you may not need to go back to your car. I, I could, would have to look into that further. Um, okay, thank you. Um, quickly, I, I think Lisa Egan's offer to meet with, that, meet with board members. Um, we should formally take her up on that. And uh, this hearing continues next week. We're continuing the hearing to March 17th. March 17th. We'll advertise it. So, so um, I would recommend between now and then, um, and the sooner the better, we meet with the businesses. Because um, to get not only get their feedback, but to have a two-way conversation about what, what what we have to do in the big picture, um, and so so um, I think opening up that conversation would be a very good good idea. Mm -hmm. So if the if the board's willing, I don't know, uh, Mark and I could um, try to arrange something. Um, uh, I'm other comfortable with that. If you, yeah, and then yeah. Bob can coordinate logistics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so... Can I just add to the top that one of the sure. things that I think would be great is if we can um, maybe ask Lisa to publicize the meeting with the maps in hand, the color maps, so people can sure. take a look themselves. I think it's it's hard if you don't have it in front of you to see mm -hmm. what's going yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So um, since this would be our subcommittee, can I recommend that one of you take point on coordinating with Lisa and then inform Bob and the rest of us? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'd be happy to do it. Uh, excuse me, uh, but I didn't want to let that point go. Uh, you mentioned a, a meeting with the businesses. I yeah. I'd like you to characterize it as a meeting with the businesses and the residents, if you could. I realize it will be posted as an open meeting. But right. I think characterizing it as businesses and the I, uh, would be Yeah, I think that, that makes good sense. Okay. Good yeah, catch. Big, yes. big building. I also uh, 
like to offer my services, my family services, where we've lived in that area for nearly 70 years now. Mm -hmm. Historically, we can tell anybody what was, what was going to be and couldn't be, so that you get a better picture, because uh, in my lifetime, we've been to more meetings about this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it just, it's history repeating itself unnecessarily. I yeah. don't, you know, when people come in and out that they don't know. But I can take advantage of the resources in the area. My neighbor up the streets lived in her house for over 60 years, almost 70 years, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of history there. Yeah. And uh, it, it can really help you form your decision. You know, when I hear this two-hour parking thing, and then you're talking about employees not having a place to park, if you do two-hour parking on Linden Street, the people who are parking all day now, who I'm pretty sure live, you know, work in the area, they're not bothering anybody. They got a place to park all day that's safe and secure, and it gets plowed out nicely in the winter time. Yeah. Not bothering us and not blocking our driveways and everything. They're going to lose their spots. Yeah. You know, so. Um, so who, who who's you, taking point on that, Mark? Or, I mean, I, talking I, with Lisa. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said you were volunteering. I'll, 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 <laughs> yeah, I guess I just volunteered. So I'll, I'll talk with you. You did. Jeez. Um, so thank you all for your contributions. Um, I, I think we created a lot more work for Julie, and I thank you for that. Um, I didn't see it that way. Um, so I'm going to add to that now with, with my list of questions. And I, and I don't expect answers, but these are, as we've been listening um, to the presentation again and from the residents, um, one of the things I'd like to see is discussion on the ripple effect around the surrounding areas, both north of that dotted line and what we are calling south of the train tracks, because the, as we shift where commuters can park, that is going to have a sprawl effect both south of the train tracks and <coughs> of the library district. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of them taking advantage of that resident parking. So it's, to your point, hard to quantify, but I think we want to make sure we don't solve one problem and create another for all of those surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why this discussion does not include reviewing the parking signage or lack of signage that exists south of means of uh, south of the train tracks um, in the downtown south area you mean the the vast amount of unregulated areas yeah, that whole area within mm -hmm. right now there's some purple there's some dotted lines there's some yellow highlights is is that is there a reason why we're not considering that because i know the focus is on businesses mm -hmm. and customers and employee parking right but it all goes hand in hand with the commuters and the commuters if they're not already in this area they're going to pour into it so right as well as north so i, I just want to make sure that gets considered right no that's we we it was part of the conversation early on um but then when we decided to focus on um the you know the kind of the more the inner core and the business area we we were like wondering if maybe so we've had a lot of feedback about the area north of the tracks we haven't really had much feedback about the area south of the tracks so we didn't want to be like a solution looking for a problem in that regard but to your point about commuters we did talk about that um, and I don't know if I have no real opinion on this whether it's right or wrong or good or bad but like currently the area down here south of the tracks like largely is unregulated and in theory could be used as commuter parking today so you know it, it, to a large degree it may be already to some degree it may not be you know if they're using the spaces up here and, and we would we would need to take that in con into consideration like you suggested the ripple effect um, some of the I'm, area, I think, has resident only for certain hours. Some of the but area down mm -hmm. here? And, like, not that, not that far. Because I, I know, like, along here, there's it's definitely <coughs> resident only. I drove all around here trying to mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. like, what it was Except like. Prescott Street. Um, yeah, Prescott yeah. Street's right yeah. here. And so what, what we didn't want to lump into this conversation is the potential of adding regulations in vast areas here that are don't have regulations currently like we really wanted to focus on the areas that are kind of currently regulated um, 
and I don't know if that's a good or bad strategy, um, but today the commuters could be parking here and, and, and they might be already. Um, I mean, I guess we're not getting a lot of complaints about that area. Uh, I think if we implement all of the changes that are suggestions, you will get complaints from the southern, mm -hmm. s the, the the southern downtown area as well as the part above that dotted line for the library district. So, I, okay. right. Um, I guess I, I just would say, like, did, like I could see it going either way. Like, people may not want striping and regulations mm -hmm. in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, especially where if it's if it really is people. I mean, right now, I guess it could be anyone. You know, from any town coming and parking here and using the commuter rail. So you know, maybe if we were talking about moving resident-only areas and we talked about striping or or putting resident-only signage like down here, that's yeah. like a whole nother group of of constituents and, and neighborhoods we really need to engage that we haven't really. Okay. So yeah, I guess, so. you know, as we, right. and I know part of that, because I've driven through there, does have some regulation. I think it's maybe the first three or four blocks. So I think maybe not as part of this discussion, but as part of an ongoing discussion, right. I definitely like to see more discussion on the northern and southern sections. So it's questions, yes. I think you'll find that most of the area south of the tracks is labeled as resident parking with a sticker. Because if you're somebody like me that's not going to pay 150 bucks to regularly park, it is really hard to find a spot to park if I want to actually take the train. Just my observation that a lot of it, I think a lot of it is full, but I believe we'll, you'll find most of it's already signed okay. for resident parking. Thank you. Just my observation. So not yes, Deputy yeah, Chief. Answer, it, Julie, that some of, most of that area around Prescott Link and everything is very heavily regulated as far as resident only. Um, mm -hmm at certain times and everything. So that's yeah. a good portion of that on the south side of tracks is already regulated uh -huh. um, in that area. So it, it wouldn't be change anything to that. It's already heavy. Okay. Thank you. Can I just add sure. the brand new can you, I'm sorry, can you please and, um, introduce sorry. yourself? Thank you. I'm Jennifer from Writing Foot Nathan. Thank you. That um, I was wondering if you could just add something to that Brandy Court law. So if the employees, if there's going to be more parking on Woburn Street, which would be great, there are some spots that you're going to add. There's a driveway that's not noted on your map right there where your yeah, right here. cursor yeah. is. Yeah. And there's no sidewalk. That's what that other gentleman yeah, was talking yeah. about. Oh, yeah. So I just didn't know if you could add that to the map because you'd have to have some sort of improvement right. or yeah. people would get hit straight mm -hmm. on. There's no, there's no even, it's just a lane for a car. Yeah. There's no even small walkway. Um, yeah, it's quite narrow. Yeah. Okay. And I do think more employee parking on Woburn Street would be used and it would move people out of Brandy Court if there was a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a long way around if you had to go yeah. the yeah. other way. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if you could just add a little something on your map as part of an expense for the improvement if you could afford it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just go through the rest of my list and again not looking for answers but just issues for consideration. Um, uh, I'm curious, there is a funeral home, I believe it's on Linden, so would the two hour parking have a detrimental effect on them? I realize that's very business specific, but it's a very unique business there. Um, when we talk about the two hour time limit effect on residents in the area, Andy, I share some of your concerns about you know, these people um, have face unique parking challenges. <coughs> And so, you know, when you live in a city, there are certain areas you can park in. There's, you know, visitor permits that you have that placard that you can put in your, in your car um, when you have visitors that are allowed to park there. I understand the desire to limit uh, or to, uh, to simplify, but at the same time, we want to be able to make sure that the people who live in these areas can live there comfortably and reasonably and be able to park in the street. Um, so just something for consideration. Um, I, you know, one of the things we're hearing a lot about is the employees parking in these lots and it seems like a cultural issue. So if the, could the issue, if the problem is that employees are taking up the spots in the inner core, I think motivating them with free parking outside is great or, or very cheap parking. It's much cheaper than tickets, right? Um, 
but I think there also needs to be some kind of communication effort um, to reach out to the employees and say, you know, you need to park further away. Many years ago, I worked in a mall, and the first thing they tell you is, you're an employee, you park in the back of the lot. Yeah. Do not take yeah. parking up front. And I realize that can sound cold, and, and for some businesses that have seniors that are employed there, that might present unique challenges that we may need to consider as mm -hmm. well. Um, or persons with disabilities. Or persons with disabilities, right. So, um, I, you know, I don't know how to get out of that one, but I'm throwing it out there as a sort of something we're hearing a lot about. Um, as far as the kiosks go, my knee-jerk reaction is to go, no. Um, I, I worry about discouraging customers coming into the area. If I have to, if I can't find street park on street parking, and I have to pay to run into the CVS and perhaps stop in at another local store, I'm going to go over to the Rite Aid and skip it entirely because the parking area is free. <coughs> so are we really discouraging what we're actually trying to encourage? Right. So I, I'm torn on this issue. Um, I would want to make sure that we understand the motivation of what we're trying to accomplish, which is the turnover that's been talked about. Um, but I also would want to see pricing for these kiosks. You know, we have from the, um, is it the, the Nelson Nygaard report, um, roughly how much it's going to cost for each individual kiosk. We're talking about, what is it, two, two lots um, at 12000 a piece, and then the cost of maintenance. What are we going to charge to get that back, and then does it then defeat the purpose? Um, so there's a lot of ways that can go, but I, I want to see data. I want to see numbers on what it's going to cost us to install, to maintain over the long run. We then have to build it into our operating costs for replacement. How often does that have to happen? Um, because I'm a, the kiosks right now, just I'll be honest, they make me a little nervous. Um, and then the last thing is if we are asking employees to move into these outer street areas, are we... I say this carefully. Um, is the town, you know, is the expect what is the expectation of snow removal, right? Because now we're asking employees to park further away in winter. How are they going to get to work safely? And I say this as someone who walks to the train every day, and when people don't shovel, I'm in the street. So, um, are, are we now asking employees to deal with that as well? I think that is everything on my list, John. Uh, John, yeah, I just have one observation. You know, I mentioned earlier to you that maybe a, you know, a, a two-step where you, you know, you try the two-hour thing and then you do the kiosk. And the more I listened, I understand why the kiosk is maybe a more important solution right now. But that being said, I go back to my example of a place that, you know, a, a brand new shopping area and gigantic parking garages that give the first two hours free so what I'm I think you could I think what you can do is mm -hmm. skin this cat two ways you know one is to get to that two hour thing so you get employees <laughs> pushing towards the employee parking area um, and you <laughs> the kiosk doesn't scare well, doesn't scare people I agree with that. because they know they can come in for two hours mm -hmm. And you know, and they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that that's something to consider as you start to look at look at the kiosk thing. It allows you to do the. Um, I mean, you got to think through. As Ann points out, there's certain things about data collection you have to be careful of. Um, but from an enforcement standpoint, you could manage it. Um, and I think that the businesses will have come and go with their clients. Um, and you know, you, if you give them the first two hours free, and then instead of a buckets, you double that. Um, you know, at the you know when this, you're still not talking about a lot of money in a relative way. Um, but I think you diminish the fear factor, which kind of I have that knee jerk that you had yeah. too. It's like, oh my god. I want to be open to it, but I'll be honest, it makes me nervous. Yeah. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so. Um, couple of thoughts. One, I think um, we need to make sure we keep our eye on the ball here too. The 
part of the purpose of the discussion was we're having issues and concerns. We're also having needs for more parking. We're having more businesses come into mm -hmm. town. We need more accessible parking. We need to have solutions that are going to deal with that. So um, the notion of kind of you know cost of kiosk, I understand there's an upfront cost, but I think it's not a it's not as much. Gee, can we get a payback for it in revenue? It's do we get a payback for it in parking, mm -hmm. in turnover, in that opportunity? So I I I actually have kind of the opposite knee jerk reaction that you do. That I think there's something here. And it may be that it's the 15 minutes. I think strikes me as way too short, um, but there's something possibly here to, to figure out and play with. Um, the other thing that I think we still need to think about is the notion of private spots and lots. So if there are people um, who have interest in offering spaces for rent or for use, uh, either formally in terms of a, a contract or informally in terms of spot hero or whatever. There may be a lot of spots in that area that could open up closer um, that we're just not aware of right now. Um, and, and it may be worth just reaching out a little bit and seeing what interest there might be. If there's no interest, okay. But if some folks might have interest in it, we might just find a bunch of spots there too. I remember at one point there was a discussion of private spots. I don't remember when this goes back a number of years now. But it was the notion of how many private spots there are in this area also. Um, and there are quite a few. There's a lot, yeah. yeah. And I just, it, it feels like, you know, the world works right now by kind of, you know, using things as you need them. And there might be something there. I, I just, I think that we should think about that as part of the solution, too. Whatever we do here, we all agree it's not going to be perfect. We're going to do the best we can. But maybe there are other things that can alleviate the situation also. So, uh, just two points to wrap it up. I think, I, I think it's key that when, when we, you know, move, change, the, change this, that we include um, some spots for EV uh, electric vehicle charging stations. You know that that's that will also be an attraction to come downtown, um, and that we also consider striping. You know, some places have um, striping or spots only for for compact vehicles, and and that that may help get more bang for our buck too. As far as the kiosk is concerned, I understand everyone's con concerns and knee-jerk reactions, um, but we've tried a lot of things and and I think Jul Julie seems to be rec recommending this as a way to sort of uh, keep things moving um, downtown. And remember that if you, you know, say it's free for half an hour, um, after that it's a buck every hour. So you go and do something for an hour and a half or two hours and a half, it costs you one or two dollars, which, which I, I don't think is you know, a huge burden um, for parking downtown and going to, um, and going to a store. Okay. Other comments from the board? Other comments or questions from the public? Thank you all for staying with us so long. All right. Um, with that, we will continue the hearing um, to March 17th. March 17th. Do we have to say the time? Hmm? 8 p.m. We'll say 8 p.m. Um, where And we will re-advertise that. In the meantime, if you're mm -hmm. welcome to reach out to us, either individually yeah. as a board, um, if you have any further questions or comments. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bob, do we have to vote daytime service? No, we do have to vote. Do we have to vote daytime service? No, because we have to re-advertise to a different member or members on the board. Yes. So if we continued it, then the new members wouldn't be eligible to vote. Got it. So it's better to re-advertise. To what? It's better to re-advertise to a motion for executive session. Are we going to executive session? I have not. All right. We are going to executive session. Give me one second to calm down. No, just read it. Okay.
All right. Move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and that the chair declare that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the body and not return to open session. Second. Uh, all those in favor?